Honorable members, uh, by way of uh, opening, I've already um, welcomed everyone. Uh, today's meeting is going to consist as about three items. The fourth one is the agenda. We are going to consider the, the report of the subcommittee on the filling of vacancies at, uh, at the Public Service Commission. That report is going to table proposed uh, <clears throat> candidates for adoption by the meeting. Thereafter, we'll get a briefing by the Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation on the first, second and third quarter performances for the financial year 2021-2022. And then briefing by Statistics South Africa on the first, second and third quarter performance uh, for the financial year 2021-2022. And lastly, get a briefing by Brand South Africa on the first, second, and third quarter performance for 2021-2022 financial year. That's how the, the agenda is structured today. Once again, welcome you all to this portfolio committee. And therefore, I declare this portfolio committee meeting open. Can we get uh, apologies if there are any apologies sent to the Secretariat? Yes, th th thank you, Jefferson. Uh, we only received uh, one apology from our member, U Honorable Tsebekulu. Uh, also, we did receive an, an apology from the Minister, Honorable Kungubel, uh, for not being able to attend the meeting. Those are the only two apologies that I have, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> There's one thing I have forgotten in my opening address, which I must make the meeting aware of. Uh, you remember that uh, Honorable Malati we were informed that Honorable Malati is now deployed somewhere else and uh, he is going to be replaced by Honorable Mbele. I hope that Honorable Mbele is in the meeting. Welcome Honorable Mbele if you, are, you have joined the meeting. And also <clears throat> Honorable Mkwebo is now replaced by Honorable Maneli. Welcome, Honorable Maneli, to this meeting. I haven't checked if these two uh, new members are, have joined the meeting or not, because I don't hear them confirming. Chair, Honorable Mbele has just joined in now. Uh, Ms. Manel is not is not here yet, Chair. Thank you. Okay, you must you must make me aware when she is in. Uh, uh, Honorable Mbele, before you logged in, I welcomed you because we were made aware that you are now replacing Honorable. Malati in the portfolio committee. Welcome once again, Honorable Mbele. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson, and good morning to everyone. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Chairperson, can you show his face, please? As a new <laughs> member of the committee. <laughs> no, I see. know him. I know him, but he can show it. Uh, I know him. There he is no, with his glasses. Yeah, I've, I've seen you, and I know you, by the way. 
We, the Secretariat has recorded an apology from Minister Gungubele and also Honorable Zabiakul. Sorry, there's a disturbance here. Is the Secretariat ready for the report that the Portfolio Committee must, cons my, must consider on the proposed candidates for the filling of vacants in the Public Service Commission? Yes, Chairperson, we'll, we'll, we'll fly, fly it through and then I, I think Mr. Ngoeva will go through to the report again. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Okay, can you can you flight it and then Mr. Ngwebe talk through it? Uh, uh, good morning, Chair, and good morning, honorable members and and colleagues. <coughs> uh, Mayor Masi, can you please enable me? I can't share it from my side. Okay, just try again. I've I've, I've given you the rights to share. Uh, honorable members, here is the report uh, that emanates from the subcommittee. As uh, you know, that uh, uh, there was a subcommittee that was established uh, to deal with the process for the recruitment of commissioners' position in the public, the National Public Service Commission. Uh, members, uh, chair, uh, and honorable members, uh, you'll allow me. I'm not going to go through page. I mean, uh, paragraph by paragraph by reading. I will just allow members, uh, uh, I'll just, just browse it through page by page and then allow members, if there's any correction or they want to make additions, they must just indicate, just to save time as well, Chairperson. Because the report was uh, uh, circulated yesterday, immediately after the subcommittee meeting uh, to, uh, to, the, uh, to the portfolio committee members. Uh, so if there's anything uh, through you, Chair, uh, members will then uh, 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 indicate. Uh, this is page one. I will just move slowly, Chair. And page two. And page three is just to outline the process undertaken from the beginning, from the advert up until uh, uh, the interviews. In all in all, the subcommittee has shortlisted 17 candidates. Uh, they are, all their names are here, honorable members. And uh, in terms of number four, it's just about the interview process, uh, when we were planning for the interview, because we have to record each and every step that the, the subcommittee has conducted. Uh, on 4.4, 4. 4, uh, uh, honorable members, uh, 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 we had an issue with the, the delays encountered with regards to the vetting. Uh, process by the Department of Sec State Security Agents. So we have highlighted that because of the committee, uh, since we have started with this process, we haven't received uh, such a report. So we, the committee, the subcommittee has recommended that uh, uh, this matter be referred to the Office of the Presidency for his attention so that uh, he consider that report uh, when he's appointing uh, the recommended candidates, three recommended candidates. So it's just to highlight that. Uh, and then on 
number five. These are the recommendations for the for the for the uh, for the portfolio committee that we are, for the subcommittee that we are presenting to the subcommittee. Uh, the first one is that the portfolio uh, portfolio committee resolved to recommend three candidates to the National Assembly in terms of Section 1968A of the Constitution for the appointment by the President to serve as commissioners for the Public Service Commission, who are as follows. Uh, these are the three recommended candidates, Ms. Zugizam Tolomba and Ms. Nancy Nomanguenya, uh, and Prof. Mandengosi Stelimakanya. Um, the 5.2 recommendations, uh, just to note uh, that the committee has ensured that a mix of candidates are recommended for the appointment by the president, which includes persons living with disability and women and youth. So we have, uh, the, the subcommittee have tried to meet this, uh, this criteria, uh, uh, where there's one person living with disability and there are two females and there's one youth. Uh, this 5.3 is about what I've just explained with regard to the state security agency, I won't read it. Uh, and the 5.4 is just to highlight uh, what the provision in the Public Service uh, Commission Act of 1997, where we are highlighting that uh, uh, a commissioner shall not hold office in any political party or political organization and a commissioner shall not, without the consent of the president, perform or engage himself or herself to perform any remunerative work outside the duties of his, his or her office. Yeah, this provi uh, provision of the Public Service Commission Act of 19 ensure that the commission remains independent and impartial from any political influence. So it's just to highlight that and uh, re-emphasize that even to the president. So in conclusion, Chair, this is the conclusion. Uh, uh, the uh, portfolio committee is therefore confident that the candidates recommended above for the appointment have a clear understanding and expected skills and knowledge of the mandate of the Public Service Commission. Uh, Chair, uh, this is the report uh, that emanates from the subcommittee for the members of the portfolio committee to, to recommend or to recommend to the, I mean, to consider. Uh, for the adoption to the National Assembly House. Thanks, Chair President and Honorable Members. Now I'm going to note members to speak. I see that Honorable Schreiber's hand is already up. Honorable Schreiber. Good morning, Chair, and good morning, colleagues. Thank you very much. Uh, and it is good to have everyone together in this meeting today after having a very small subcommittee for a while. Um, Chair, I'd like to make a proposal uh, that I'd ask the committee just to consider uh, <clears throat> as we move forward with this. So um, <clears throat> I went back and looked at the uh, an earlier recommendation uh, regarding a vacancy that existed at the Public Service Commission. Uh, and what I found, Chair, is that there are actually four vacancies currently. So the National Assembly appoints five people to the National Public Service Commission, and four of those positions are vacant. So there are obviously three that we are recommending here today. But as regards the fourth vacancy, uh, I went and checked, and that's one that actually goes back to 2019. It's been vacant for almost three years now, two and a half years. Um, and uh, that was a recommendation that was made by or to the National Assembly that did not pass. Uh, and actually, it has remained vacant up until today. So in terms of Rule 351 of the National Assembly, that recommendation has actually lapsed. In other words, we are actually dealing with a fourth vacancy here uh, for which there's currently uh, no recommendation on the agenda of Parliament and, and no current uh, ability for us to fill it. So here's the proposal that I would like to make, Chair. It is that uh, we, we write to the Chair of Chairs to confirm what I've said is correct. In other words, that there is a fourth vacancy and that there's currently no other recommendation waiting to serve before the National Assembly. And if that is the case, Chair, I'd like us to consider actually filling all four vacancies instead of only the three that we are considering here today. Now, the reason for that is, first of all, the stability 
the instability that's been at the Public Service Commission because of this long-standing vacancy. And we all know that if we're not filling all four vacancies today, and if we leave one empty, it's going to probably take another six months, if we're lucky, before we're able to actually get around to filling that fourth vacancy, because we know the committee's agenda is already full uh, and it will take a long time, we just know from experience. So in the interest of stability at the Public Service Commission, but also for, for Parliament to actually save on resources and time, my proposal is that we, we just pause this until next week and we get uh, the confirmation from the Chair of Chairs uh, about that fourth vacancy being uh, open as well and that there's nothing currently else before Parliament. And then we bring it back, Chair, and we just add a fourth uh, name, and we've already gone through that ranking process. And then we would be actually able to fill every single vacancy at the Public Service Commission. Uh, for the first time since uh, the 2019 election, we would actually be able to have a full complement of all five National uh, Public Service Commission commissioners, all appointed at the same time. And then we would have uh, achieved that objective that we've been struggling with, Chair. So uh, that's my proposal, that we consider just uh, pausing for a week. We'll lose one week, Chair, but we may save six or nine months uh, of, of instability at the Public Service Commission. So this would really be a win-win situation. Uh, so I ask that we get that clarity from the Chair of Chairs. And if there's indeed an opportunity for us to fill that fourth vacancy as well, that we just bring it back to the committee next week uh, to consider, and we would actually be able to do the PSC a really big service and save on resources for Parliament uh, by creating that stability and filling all four vacancies. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. <clears throat> I don't think that will be proper, Honorable Schreiber, because the, 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 these processes are not linked. We, we must go back to that process that failed. We can't, we can't <clears throat> now, after <clears throat> shortlisting, interviewing, and recommending who should be appointed and bring the name that did not pass or select from those who have applied now, it won't be a, a correct one. But uh, I have also made the, the chair of chairs aware of that vacancy. He is going to come back to me. I say it is not proper to, to fill that vacancy here now today. It must take its own process and the chair is gonna come back to me very soon because we must fill that vacancy as well very soon. I see that uh, Honorable Mbele's hand is up and Honorable Gondre. Um, uh, Chairperson, I think Honorable Gondre's hand had got up before mine. Uh, if you can go first, then I go. Can I go ahead, Chair? Chair? Chairperson? Go ahead, Honorable Gondre. All right, thank you, uh, Chair. Chair, I think where we're coming from is 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 a you know from a practical point of view that we 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 do have um, four people, four fit and proper people that um, are available for these positions, and you know it would make sense. I mean, when we look at the fact that we'll also be saving money and we'll be ensuring that um, all posts are filled. I understand your reservations around the fact that. Um, you know, um, there was a process that was run then and this is separate, but you will recall that that process was um, wrecked with um, irregularities around how things were done, but the current processes um, are quite in order and I think that they can cover whatever shortcomings were experienced in the previous pro process. So I think we're coming from, from, from a point of view of, of saying that we should do what is practically, uh, you know, um, in the interests of the Public Service Commission. 
um, in this instance, and also um, as a way of saving expenses because advertising again and going through this process has cost implications. You're going to fly a number of candidates into parliament again um, just for the interviews. So um, I think we're looking at it from a very practical and, and, and pragmatic um, you know, point of view. And, and, and that's why I, 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 you know, I support what Honorable Schreiber has just said. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairperson. Uh, I mean, obviously, I have no background in the previous uh, process that uh, has been referred to. Um, but picking up on what you had said, that you have already written to the, the chair of chairs to um, uh, uh, get, get feedback and guidance concerning uh, that previous appointment process, which does align and dovetail with the first a proposal in Honorable Schreiber's suggestion, which, which would be that of writing to the chair of chairs. Um, uh, my question would be if it's if, if there's anything fundamentally objectionable in then simply waiting for a response uh, from the chair of chairs, given that that is the overlapping um, uh, uh, sort of view on, on the way forward. Um, yeah, that's that's just my question and my query is that it's already gone in the query to the chair of chairs, as Honorable Schreiber is suggesting should be done. Um, and then from there, we'll, we'll have final, firm and concrete uh, guidance um, on how to go forward concerning that, that fourth vacancy. Thanks, Chair. Honorable Ndoli, followed by Honorable M Mutsipe and Honorable. I was first to... how, first... how can you say that? Because I'm checking my gadget. Oh, no, I'm sorry, Chair, but I think when I raised my hands, it, we were only three. Sorry for that. Okay. Chair. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, greetings uh, uh, to the meeting and uh, thank you to the a presentation that has been done in terms of the candidates that were interviewed in this regard. Chair, I think as the, I, I don't know what's going on, Mina Ivel, it's, it's, my video is not appearing, Chairperson, I don't know, but I did tap on the video. It's saying stop video, start video. Uh, it's, it's, I can I can see you, Honorable. Uh, oh, as, as, as long as you can see me, that's fine. Chair, I think as the portfolio committee, we should we should be not contradict ourselves. We know very well that we've been um, undergoing uh, the process of the interviews of candidates. And if we now bring the matter that was already before Parliament into our hands, I, I, I think uh, we are sort of taking this too far. If that is the case, Chair, I would understand if the subcommittee uh, may be felt whilst they were dealing with the the, the, the interviews to say, by the way, as the portfolio committee, we had the um, item that is outstanding. The item that is before parliament, why can't we go back to the portfolio committee? Because even on that note, you, you wouldn't do it as the subcommittee. You would come back to the portfolio committee so that it is endorsed by the portfolio committee, if ever it is endorsed, to be taken back to, for you, Chairperson, to write the letter to, to the uh, 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 um, chair of chairs. In this regard, I don't see any way of, of us including that matter in, in this process. You've done the process, you've, you've finished the process, and, and let's uh, look forward to the president doing the appointments. And uh, if we feel that uh, 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 we want it, that process back to us, 
it's before parliament anyway. It's parliament that should tell us as, as to what is going to, 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 to happen about that uh, 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 outstanding matter. Thank you, Chair, and the meeting. Honorable Mtipe. Thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. And I'm sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, Chairperson, I don't feel that we must do as my other colleagues are saying, especially the DAs, that we must just take things as we wish because at the end it's going to hit back to us when things are not going well. So it's better to go through all the processes that we should go. We must not hijack or do things double up. So I, I am in the view that, as you have said, Chair, that we must go through all the processes correctly, properly, no matter we save money or we don't save money, those are the processes that we must go through. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Honorable Komani and then Honorable uh, Sibisi. Thank you very much, Chair, and good morning, colleagues. Uh, Chair, uh, having heard what Honorable Shoyaba is saying, I am of the view, supporting Honorable Mutsepe to say, let us not uh, set a bad precedence. We have spoken about precedence in the subcommittee. This may let us then complete the subcommittee work, hand it over to the portfolio committee. Uh, whatever that he is raising, yes, it, it is it, it has it it told water. But for the for us to now, after closing the process of the subcommittee and opening it the other way around. It, it, it's going to be uh, seemed as if uh, we're not doing our things correct. Let us then, call, uh, uh, it does not matter whether we're saying we're going to save costs and that, and that but the, the, the effect of the matter is we shall have flawed the procedure. So I'm suggesting that we stick to the uh, report of the subcommittee, hand it over as it is to the portfolio committee, not dilute it. And then if there is something that will arise, we'll then deal with it as and when it comes. Thank you very much. Honorable Spisi, followed by Honorable Mkweba. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. And for this, but what I wish to check, Chairperson, what was the problem for this post not being advertised and why is it taking so long? Or what was the problem for it not? To, I understand I mean it fades from parliament to respond. What was the delay? I mean, we'll just wish to check that one. Thanks, Honorable Chair. Can I respond to this honorable Mgwewa because before I, I, I allow you to speak. You see, I, I am a generous chairperson. I should not have allowed this discussion had I known he's gonna go this way. Because my generosity now is spoiling the meeting. There is no agenda item before us today in terms of that process that did not pass in the, in the house. But let me hear what Honorable Mkweba is saying. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, good morning, uh, Honorable Members and um, everyone in the meeting. Chair, I think your response um, was in order because my worry is that, uh, Honorable Members, the the matter we are discussing is not part of the minutes from the subcommittee and of which I think I agree with honorable members that um, spoke about this matter before, that is before parliament because the fourth weekends that we're talking about is before parliament and I will then propose that honorable chair and honorable members that um, uh, we must then uh, 
agree that the chair must brief us in the next meeting of what is going to happen in terms of dealing with the fourth vacancy. But uh, chair, now the minutes of the subcommittee are before us. And uh, I thought that we'll then discuss whether the minutes of the subcommittee and also the recommendations are in order in terms of the Public Service Act. Therefore, Chair, in your response, you have uh, briefed the committee that uh, uh, the matter is, the, is with Parliament and obvious you will then uh, from time to time communicate or liaise with um, a, a chair of chairs, uh, Honorable Frolic. Therefore, I will then uh, request that uh, we then um, put this matter aside and discuss the minutes of the subcommittee. And then, Chair, lastly, I'm moving with the, the adoption of these um, minutes of the subcommittee, Chair. Oh, Honorable Kibi. Thank you, thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, good morning, Chair, uh, Honorable Members, and everybody in the meeting. Honorable Chair, I want to align myself with the latter speakers to say, uh, let's proceed with today's business. That is now the report uh, tabled before us on the three candidates that we have proposed in the process. Uh, the other one, the fourth one, let's uh, allow the chairperson to engage and that one will be a new process that we are going to be taking. But this one, it does not, uh, it can't make a uh, part of what we have already done. So let's proceed, Honorable Chair, and that one will be advertised when a uh, parliament sends it back to us as the committee. Thank you, Chair. I see Honorable Shaiba's hand is up again. Thank you, Chair. Thanks. Okay, Chair, so having listened to this discussion, I think there are a few things that don't quite make sense. The first is that uh, it is not for the subcommittee <clears throat> to deal with this matter. It is for the full portfolio committee, which is why it is being raised and discussed here. It is this portfolio committee of order. that does have the authority to... Point of order, Chair. I was going to raise that point of order, Honorable Point of order, Komani. Chair. Can I hear the point of order, Honorable Komani? Thank you very much, Chair. Let us, uh, 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 my point of order is that, can we confine ourselves to that work that was uh, given to us as the subcommittee? Let us then go to the report, Chair, and then the others will deal with them in the next portfolio committee if the need arises. Thank you very much. The point of order is sustained. Okay, Chair, can I just request that this matter is put on the agenda for the next portfolio committee meeting, this fourth vacancy then. Thank you. You, you, you are out of order again, Honorable Shrive. There is no agenda item for today's meeting with reference to this point you are raising. But Chair, are you saying we can't request agenda items for the next meeting? I've only requested that we put this on the next meeting. You are meeting. out of order? No. I have ruled you out of order. Can I get a second to what has been proposed? Chair, Honorable Komani. Yes, Honorable Komani, take the floor. Thank you very much, Chair. I second the adoption of the subcommittee minutes. Thank you very much. Chair, please note the objection of the Democratic Alliance. I will be out of order to note that objection here because it is irrelevant. Uh, at this point, honorable members, I want to move off now to the third agenda item which is the consideration no 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 i'm wrong i'm wrong let me get myself right yeah we are going to get to this point now briefing by the department of planning monitoring and evaluation on the first and second 
and third quarter performance for financial year 2021 2022 before that i would like to <coughs> welcome the i have heard that the the minister is not available and i suppose both deputy ministers are here can i invite any of those uh, deputy ministers to just introduce this uh, agenda item and make an opening remarks in that regard. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members. Chair, just before I, I go into the opening remarks, uh, I want, I'm asking the committee to acknowledge the uh, apology of DMC Weya. She will be joining us around half past 10. She's dealing with an urgent matter of um, MDDA now. And then uh, there's also DG Nguna, who is on study leave currently. The acting DG is Dr. Grizel. She's also with us here. Uh, I'm joined also by the DDG corporate, who's Dr. Nsiki. And from Status A, it's uh, Statistician General Rasinga Maduleke, who's leading the team, and the chair of uh, Brenda's A, Metandi Tobias Pokolo. Uh, with the acting CEO, Stembil and Tombe. So this is the team that uh, constitute um, the, the DPME and its uh, entities. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. We are here this morning to report to the committee on the DPME performance report on quarters one, two, and three and those individual reports will be taken through by our DDG corporate, Mayor Nziki. But before I do that, just some few highlights and achievements that will be illustrating to the members of the portfolio Honorable, Honorable, Honorable dear, can you, can, you. You, can you hold a bit? I see that Honorable McLuhan's hand is up and Honorable Nduli. What is it now? Because we have gone past that item. Follow uh, chairman to look follow chair. I am the Nancy chair. Do I and Pagam Sang over when I'm saying, Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, all right. Chairperson. <laughs> Honorable McClure, what is the chairperson? My, my humble apologies. I didn't want to interfere uh, while there was an introduction. I, I just want to, to check, Chair. You know, this is not the first time that the minister is not available. At the end of the day, the minister is accountable to this portfolio committee. And every time we accept this kind of apologies, I think as a committee, we should uh, consider this and perhaps write to the minister and raise our concern as a portfolio committee uh, a guard regarding his shining absence in most, if not all, of our meetings. Thank you, Chair. Can you continue, uh, DM Kekan? Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Um, Chair, uh, just some few highlights on the achievement uh, because we will be table in those three individual quota reports from quota one to quota three. Um, we are on track as the department in meeting our APP targets by the end of March 2022. And uh, of course, by the end of quota three, which is December 2021, the department achieved 71% of its target and as at the end of the third quarter, the department had spent 59% of the budget. However, as at the end of February 2022, the expenditure also increased to over 
So Chair, we have performed well. And just to illustrate a number of issues that we are bringing also to the attention of the portfolio committee, we have now uh, come up with the National Annual Strategic Plan, which, is, which we call the NASP which has been adopted and is being institutionalized through our government, will have an opportunity when the final NASP uh, document is, is adopted, we will be coming through to parliament to take members of the portfolio committee on the national annual strategic plan, how it links and, and informs our annual performance plans. The other issue, Chair, is around the stabilization and recovery to reverse the impact of the pandemic. That will also be outlined in our quarterly reports, how we have prioritized and accelerated programs and interventions to enhance our capacity as the state to deliver better and faster. Those will be shared with the committee. But there are also issues of process which include planning, policy, legislation, and institutional arrangement. So one of the things we have just come up with as, as the department is to change the format of reporting going forward. So in this coming APPs of 2022, 2023, 2023, and 2024, all departments, as we present, will be looking at how we have aligned the national development plan with the medium term strategic framework with our NASP, the national annual strategic plan, and how all this informs our APP and how all of them link to the budget. So appropriation must talk to the NDP as our blueprint. And as I said, there are policy issues that we are looking at, which also include the policy framework for integrated planning. So now that you know that we, we are on the DDM model, one budget, one, one, one plan, now the integrated planning bill is also underway. So the policy framework for integrated planning will also inform the integrated planning bill, which we will also take members through. So the NPC Secretariat, which is the National Planning Commission Secretariat and Sector Monitoring will also be showing how they have been achieving and making sure that whatever progressive report we are bringing speaks towards the National Development Plan. Chair, of course, there are areas where we have not done well. Uh, delays in procurement, and one of those speaks to the centralized data management administration system, which is a system that will be integrating all um, data, uh, uh, the existing standalone systems that are in the department. So we are going to reduce duplication. We are going to improve through the system interface between departments as they submit information to DPME. So it's one of the turnaround strategies that we're doing. The other area where we have underperformed uh, and which is very worrying is the presidential hotline. But we, we are confident Chair, that by March the 23rd, when we come to the portfolio committee, we'll also be presenting a turnaround strategy that will make us to improve on the, the, the presidential hotline and how the three spheres of government are able to be agile in responding to the queries of our community. So in a nutshell, those are the things. And if you allow me, Chair, can I invite Dr. Nziki Mashia to present to members of the Portfolio Committee. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ntsiki Mashia, you can take the platform.
Sekimashia, you can take the platform. Thank you, Chair. Good morning uh, to the Chair, honorable members, and thank you to the um, DM for introducing the presentation. I am trying to flight the presentation so that uh, members can see. Is it visible now? It is and coming members? up. Uh, I can see it. I can see it is the. It's DPME presentation, quarter one, two, three. I can see that there. Fine. If I see it, I suppose everybody can see. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. So I would like to just uh, start with this slide. The purpose is to present, as Chair has already introduced, and, and the DM. And I'll quickly just go to the contents of the presentation. Our presentation has the mandate, the vision, the mission and functions of DPME. It is always important for us to contextualize our performance within those because we have been mandated that we have been given and we have a mission that we want to achieve as a DPME. And we always want to flag the functions, the spaces that we focus on to achieve the results in terms of the budget that has been voted to us as the department. And uh, so we'll show in detail the, the performance from quarter one to quarter three against the APP that we tabled 2021-22. And lastly, we'll then conclude and, and uh, show uh, and, 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 and have recommendations to the committee. I would not like to spend time on this, but to say that the vision and mission is as was tabled in the APP and uh, as well as the values of the PME that, are, that we are client focused. Those are the three functions of the Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation. Uh, we always flag them so that it, it um, grounds our discussions. That is the mandate. And we like to always emphasize that in terms of our mandate, we work in working the four areas, planning, monitoring, evaluation, as well as interventions. And in terms of planning, as it shall be shown in the presentation that I'm making, we are looking at both long-term, medium-term, as well as short-term planning, institutionalizing planning, using those dimensions, and then also ensuring coordination of planning in the spheres of government, ensuring alignment of the plans with the policies and the long-term planning instruments, and also looking at the quality of plans. We monitor the implementation of the NTP as well as MTSF by the robust tools that we use for monitoring. And this all is backed up by evidence. And we use evaluations to evaluate critical government programs with the intention of informing planning as well as monitoring and, and government interventions so that we government can prioritize appropriately. The interventions that we get seized with are the interventions on behalf of cabinet and interministerial committees, such as the interventions that we've been busy with at Northwest, Northwest uh, amongst other interventions. I'd like to start with just the highlights. The Deputy Minister uh, has already shared all the highlights. The NASP has mentioned, DDM he has mentioned, and I'd like to just talk about the biannual reporting. Biannual reporting has assisted in consolidating the work coming both from NTP and MS MTSF monitoring. And it has given us the results that I'm going to show in the slides when I'm showing performance of program to, and then also I'd like to mention that uh, the, the NPC, the third uh, commission was appointed by president in December, 2021. It is important to know, to report that to the committee. It is the last point on the highlights, other areas that uh, DM has talked to. Now, I think this is a critical slide that shows all the three quarters. It shows the number of targets we had planned for each program, as well as the targets that we achieved. I, they say pictures speak more loud than words. You can see just at a glance when you're looking at this slide that with quarter one, we achieved 79% and at quarter 
three, the department achieved a 71%. And it is important for me to say, as I report it, honorable chairperson and honorable members, that we are actually in March now, which is the very last month of the financial year. And therefore the pictures has been changed drastically from what it was at the time in December. Now going to programs by programs, starting from program one, the main of purpose of this program is to, purport, to, to provide strategic leadership and management and support services to the department. And this is a program that has got a, a, a targets that were set and out of the targets that were set, 67 targets and 33 targets were missed. And I will just go to this slide to show where the areas uh, of non-achievement where the green dashboard says it is targets achieved. So I would like us to just look at where we did not achieve. It was in the submission of disclosures. At the SMS uh, level, where we achieved 98%, and uh, at MMS, we achieved uh, 94%. And I will s uh, talk to this when we talk about the remedial actions that we have taken in terms of targets that were not achieved. And uh, these uh, targets were achieved, all of them. And I'd like to talk about this critical target of the vacancy rate. Here we had planned to achieve 5% of the vacancy rate and we achieved in the third quarter 8%. However, the picture has changed now. And I would like to say that whilst the standard uh, target for government is 10%, as DPME wanting to be a leader, a lead, a wanting to lead in government, we set the target tight for ourselves. We wanted to achieve 5%. This means that we are still within the norm of government, but it is because we believe as DPME that for even one person that is in the department, there's space for that person or employee to play. So this is why we do not measure ourselves like other government departments that will aim for less than 10%. We set it tight and it, because there were deaths in this period in the department, there were some people who resigned and exited the department. And then we ended up falling, falling within 8% instead of the 5% we had set for ourselves. There's, Another area that we found uh, to be a challenge, ICT, we are achieving the targets, but because of the intense demand uh, for ICT support, uh, because there are officials that must work from home because of comorbidities they had applied, and therefore that meant increase the number of uh, requests for support, and those were ad hoc requests in terms of what was planned by ICT plan in terms of the ICT strategy. So we fell in 81% whilst we had targeted to achieve 85% in this area. Again, then there's an area of enterprise supplies where, where we have to get 30% of BE score. This, when we presented to the committee, the annual report, we indicated that this attack, it has been disputed under dispute because of the measurement tool that is used to assess government departments. So it has still been under dispute, but in the remedial actions, we talk about what we have done as DPME because this is not only the challenge for the Department of Planning, it is a challenge for public sector the tool that is used to assess, to do scoring in the public sector, which is the same as the tool that is used in the private sector, which makes the initiatives that we take in the public sector not to be counted because of the way they ask questions with that tool they use for assessment. Ending in this program one is the key important issues to highlight that our reports all are edited and performance verified by internal audit before we submit to treasury, before we submit to the portfolio committee. So therefore the figures that we're publishing here are audited figures. 
And of course, we are very serious about implementing internal audit. We have got an internal audit that is independent for ensuring governance and is reporting to the audit committee. We planned in nine uh, 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 in, in, in internal, in, internal audit plan. We've implemented nine audits so far, and we currently are having three audits in progress to keep checking that we are actually in line, we are complying, we are in strict in governance as the department. ICT will continue to highlight that it is positioned strategically in terms of capacity, skills, so as to be able to cope with the new trends of supporting employees that work, that work remotely because COVID is still here with us. So ICT had to be stepped up to be able to cope with that. And also I'd like to put to the honorable members that we have to, we had to find a way of upping our awareness strategy and its implementation and prioritizing that as a way of promoting a holistic approach to dealing with the impact of COVID-19 employees. Our department did a COVID-19 country report that showed the wide impact of COVID in the, in the society, not only the economic uh, impact, but actually social, the emotional, the psychological. And therefore we took from that and saw that it is important that we really look into the employees because whilst they're employees yet, whilst they may not have been positive at work, but they live in the society, they have people at home, they live with families and they have been affected or in, in one way or other, another by the COVID. And therefore we address that to our implement, in the implementation of the wellness strategy. Uh, labor relations in the department, we are just monitoring that area closely, not because we have issues, we want to ensure that there is stability in the department so that work can be delivered. Going to program two, which is national planning. And program two has got two programs, National Planning Commission Secretariat, as well as National Planning Coordination. And the work that comes out of this area is that it talks to the planning landscape in the country, as I shall show. The DM is, I think in the introduction, said the National Planning Se Commission Secretariat is achieving 100% their target. And I think the, the honorable members will be interested to see where is this work, what is this 100% uh, talking to. So the green dashboard talks to that 100% and I would like to just come here. So their work culminates into us being able to see what has been done in the landscape of planning. So on my extreme left, I have put the, the NDP, which is a blueprint that was adopted in 2012. And then that is followed by the MTSF, the 2019 to 2024 MTSF that has its priorities, uh, seven priorities of the sixth administration. And we are implementing that uh, as government, but also within that space of planning, there are short term plans like the economic recovery and, and the reconstruction plan that the DM spoke about that is also showing the responses to COVID-19 as well as responding to the civil unrest that uh, um, we had uh, as a country. So in terms of the landscape, we are saying we're at midpoint. This is what is coming from the planning space. And as a result, we are reviewing now the 10 years of the NDP. We are celebrating 10 years, but now we're doing the review to see how far are we in terms of the targets we had set for ourselves for this time. We're also reviewing this MTSF of 2019 to 2024. And we also now have put in place the NASP National Strategy Annual Strategic Plan, which is a, rather a short term a, a plan that is going to be reviewed annually because it takes from these long and medium term plans and priorities of government, and it actually is linking straight to the planning of departments, their APPs. We see the departments are, in, are assessed for alignment to this, and we actually will be able to see annually whether there is a, actually the, the impact that is a, a, a achieved by having that short term plan and the rising the implementation in, in government. So 
these all the planning uh, tools they inform the priorities of government, especially the reviews that we are going. They are going to tell us how we can then consolidate the priorities for the remainder of the term um, in terms of the MTSF up to 2024. They'll also tell us the pathways to the NDP, which is a going to which is up to 2030. So these proposals are going to be used for the implementation moving forward, for the planning and implementation moving forward. This is the planning perspective. Again, we just show in this, uh, through this uh, um, picture that whilst we have the long-term plan NTP, a blueprint for the country, we also had developed with the medium term strategic framework that uh, we are currently implementing. And then this, Another one that uh, uh, 2019, uh, to, after 2019, that we're going to be left with, the last one before 2030. All of these, the, uh, the ERPs that I've talked about, the sector plans like infrastructure plans, skills plans, all of these plans are aimed at addressing these social ills, poverty, unemployment, and inequality as captured in our vision 2030. So the reviews that we are doing must be able to give us what we need to prioritize from 2024 to 2030. We will be able to get from all the work that came from those long, medium, short plans and their reviews. We will know that when we are left with X number of years to 2030, this is what we need to do. Um, I, I think that is what has come out of the planning space. And this slide, I think DM explained the two things I would say about this slide, that all our plans are based or in the constitution, the policy, the laws, um, the SONA commitments. We can see where they originate from, the ruling party mandates. We can see they come from the long-term plan, the, the NDP. But what is important is that all of these have been now integrated into the uh, budgeting uh, prioritization, prioritization uh, space and they influence the budget process and the discussions now at the country level should be a, the ability to see that what that which is funded is actually that which has been prioritized by government and that which is implemented annually is talking from the national annual strategic plan and getting everyone around the country rallied around one plan and resources rallied up around the same plan. And I think this is actually showing that we have moved in terms of the planning, we have more made strides in terms of aligning planning with budgeting. Hence, in this slide, we are just demonstrating all the planning instruments and how they have actually led to the, uh, the very last, latest, the NASP, which is the National Annual Strategic Plan, which is actually straddling between finance planning, financing and implementation. It brings the three together. So this is what now uh, the, the, on the DM was saying that the members of the committee would be taken through the contents of the NASP once the, the, that document has been finally uh, adopted. Then uh, I will not then uh, talk about the screen dashboard. Planning coordination has achieved those targets. It is quite important to say that they, they, those targets for the quarter one, quarter two, they didn't have the targets. And then in the in the uh, last uh, in quarter two, they had that a uh, budget prioritization framework. And I am uh, I would like to then report that that work at least has been uh, done by the end of the third quarter. And then the, the diagnostic report uh, that was supposed to be produced in when I talk about the remedial uh, measures and actions taken, the members will be able to see that that work is already underway. So whilst in December it has, was not yet produced, but now it, it, the picture has changed. The work is underway in that space. Um, the contents of the NASP, uh, the DM talked to the 
NASP is focusing on stabilization and recovery, prioritizing and acceleration programs uh, towards tangible and results towards tangible outcomes. But also she, she emphasized the process issues because we have seen the importance of those and how they actually influence implementation and execution actually and the ability to get the results. So they, they, we have made this slide available so that the honorable members can indulge on the NASP and what that stabilization and recovery strategy is applicable to. We have listed those areas for better understanding. And I think if further engagements are needed on us, that they be given a chance to, to, to further detail that. Program three, which is sector monitoring. The purpose of this program is to ensure a government policy coherence. They develop a facilitate and support monitoring and implementation of government uh, priorities as well as sector plans and intervention strategies. And this is one of the programs that has been achieving their targets 100%, as you can see in the green dashboard. But I would like to share with the members what has come out of their monitoring work. They have plan to monitor in areas, they plan to report in areas, and they are bringing to the committee the results of their monitoring, which is this slide. This slide, uh, which is coming also from Stats SSA, the data from it, it, it gives a picture of where we are as a country in terms of growth, unemployment, employment, investment, inequality, and poverty. And if we're looking at this slide, just as a country, these are key outcome indicators and they come from the NDP 2030. So we had set our targets uh, in both in the NDP to be at 5% in the growth and the MTSF we have 2020, 19 to 2024, we had set the target to be at two to 3%. Current was where we are, we're at minus six. And in the unemployment, we are at 34 vis-a-vis -vis the target of 6% uh, uh, that we have set and the 20% that we had set at the MTSF. And in the, um, in the in the, in investment, we are at 13%, 13.6. And then in inequality, we are at 0 0.68, 0 0.68. And the poverty, which comprises of food poverty, and lower bound poverty, we can see that we are actually not doing well as the country. We are actually a, a below um, the target in lower bound poverty. We we are below the target that we are set by this uh, time for up to 19 to 2024. We are currently at 38, 39%. And uh, the seven priorities of government that we uh, look at both from the perspective of the MTSF and uh, the SONA commitments that were made with, with this uh, monitoring has given us the results in the seven priorities. The honorable members we will, will see in the slide that I will show that we have progressed but have not achieved our targets in uh, most of those priorities except for priority number six, which is social cohesion and safe communities. Uh, uh, so uh, target number four, sorry, consolidating the social waste through reliable and quality basic services. There we have uh, achieved the state of the province, uh, the, state, nation, the state of the nation address said no person in South Africa will go hungry. And then they will, uh, programs that have to be done there to actually ensure that we achieve the rural development, local government, human settlement, safety and security and social protection. And this is where we seem to be doing well because we are at 83% in terms of the targets that we wanted to achieve. We were planned to achieve 61%. Those EMBER, the targets that are EMBER, means therefore that the achievement has been between 50 and 74 percent but we have not achieved that which we had planned to achieve and where that in the dashboard is red it means therefore that 
we have received less than half of the, what we had aimed to achieve in terms of the priorities. So the honorable members will then be able to engage one by one. But what I want to share is that the, the, what comes from the monitoring reports is that uh, the state is, 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 is finding a challenge to be the unevenness in the capacity. In the capacity. Uh, the, and that unevenness in the local, provincial, and uh, national government, it leads to uneven performance. They also say that whilst there are many individual initiatives, but there is a challenge of um, here and there people tending to jump from one quick fix or, or another policy fed to another. And that these challenges manifest themselves in also in the weaknesses in the political administrative interface space, as well as in the intergovernmental relationships, as well as in intergovernmental relations and citizen engagement, as well as the quality of the services that are delivered. Now, all these things have become clearer and have come out as our teams are going out there to monitor in terms of what we had uh, targeted to do, in terms of the indicators we have set, and in terms of what is coming out, uh, you know, from the citizens. So this team, this monitoring team, now produced just two reports, and these two reports identify the persistent areas. So it means these areas in, in the report that's produced twice a year, they've been persistently showing poor performance in other areas and under performance in other areas, except for that green dashboard. Um, and I would like to talk to the observations now that they have made. They said there are key required requisites that can help us as a state if we want to be able to achieve our targets. These prerequisites that they were put coming by the NDP, uh, which are focused leadership, a NDP being seen as a plan for all, not just for government, a, the ability to, risk, to mobilize resources towards a plan, the institutional capacity, when we talk institutional capacity, including even the, the state-owned entities, the agreements on trade-off, on trade-offs, as well as social compacts on how to tackle poverty and unemployment, a, as well as inequality. Those have not really materialized, whilst they were outlined, but they have not materialized and they're actually in influencing the results that we want to see. That is why we are seeing the picture that we're seeing in the slides prior to this one. The second observation that the, the monitoring has made through the NTP and, and MTSF monitoring, that they, they are how to translate policy into higher level aspirations and high level aspirations into actual implementation is where it, 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 it becomes critical, is where the tire hits the road. So this is why we see that an instrument such as the NASP, the National Annual Strategic Plan, that says to it that all these priorities are captured in one document as just 10 priorities and everyone aligned to those, aligned to those may be able to address that. This requires robust monitoring and measuring tools and it also requires uniform and consistent indicators. It came, this came out of the review of the NTP as well as MTSF. And the point that the National Planning Commission made is that there needs to be a dialogue both inside and outside government on how to improve implementation. Because it is clear that now it's not about the planning, it's not about the monitoring, it's about implementing at various levels at, at, at various institutions, how, what needs to be done. So that dialogue needs to continue to ensure improvement in implementation. I will come to program four, and the, this program is main, aimly a, 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 to, to, to ensure implementation of medium term strategic framework by monitoring and improving the capacity of the state institutions, as well as to develop and implement plans for providing services. This is a program that has got a very serious a, a, a 
uh, responsibilities because they have to do the work of the performance annual uh, performance management of the ministers. So in the quarter one, they were supposed to have produced a status report on the annual assessment of the ministers. Uh, but quarter three, they were able to produce the report on contracting and media assessment. So with the picture has changed, they have now produced this work. And also this program is a program that the DM spoke about that it has a challenge in the area of the presidential hotline. The PMDS, the status report on evaluation of the head of departments, that work is moving. The report has been produced, agreements are being reviewed, and then the report produced, that one is fine. The hotline, the DM said that they have been given the opportunity to come with a strategy to improve performance, to come with a strategy of modernizing that hotline. And on the 23rd of March, they are coming to the portfolio committee with that improvement strategy. So I will not spend more time now that there is a specific date for them to come to the committee and say, this is what they're going to do differently to ensure that the resolution of, of, of complaints move from that 30, 30%, they are able to achieve 60% or even more. And even the model that they'll be using for resolving the complaints, which has shown to be a challenge, the model itself. Then the last part I wanted to, to, to talk about is the piloting of them. They were supposed to uh, produce in quarter two, the, the, the proactive monitoring system uh, in one province. Now, at this time, they have actually done that at quarter three. They have done the, in the, um, the monitoring report they produced, and then they, they have also uh, shown the performance and capacity of economic reco recovery in the report that is, they've produced. And the plan to roll out uh, uh, that, plan, that, that plan. Uh, Okay, I will not spend time on the DTM. I think that the DM spoke about all that we are saying that we see DTM as an opportunity for integration and collaboration in government. And we can see the results. The PME continues to champion that. They are really improving work at the state, at, um, at, the, at the local government state. But uh, here, this team also did important work on the COVID vaccination rollout. They plan to do this work they achieved, and I'll be able to show towards the end of this slide how the work of DPME through programs like this can actually show results at the phase, at core phase level, so that the citizens themselves are able to see what government is doing. So. It is important to say, yes, they achieved what they wanted to achieve, the media monitoring report on the performance and capability of COVID vaccination. But I want to showcase this when I show how the entire work of DPME tied up together actually leads to the production of results. And I think that's what is important for the committee. I come to program five, which is evaluation evidence and knowledge system, this branch coordinate and support the generation of a collation and accessibility of timely use of quality, day, quality evidence to support performance monitoring and evaluation across government. So they planned their targets uh, in the first quarter, second quarter, they achieved 75% uh, and missed 25. And then in the third quarter, they achieved 80 and missed 20% of their targets. But uh, let us just look at this. The D DM talked about that evidence, um, this, the central system for data that we are working at towards SDPME. This is the uh, part DM was talking about that because of procurement, it was delayed. But I am then pleased to say that at this time, as I'm reporting now, this has been is at the evaluation stage and therefore we are actually looking to see 
this project because it's a huge project for us is a hope for us as a department to have an integrated data system that puts together all the, the data that the DPME uses for monitoring. So it is a huge project for us. It contributed to the uh, uh, budget picture that we see, expenditure picture that we see. However, now it has progressed into a state, stage um, of uh, evaluations. Now, the selected evaluations are totally with, we agreed as DPME that we bring to the committee the actual selected evaluation so that the committee can see which programs have been evaluated and how that can bring a turnaround in government. These programs have been a challenge and I think portfolio committee has been talking about these areas. One area is the accommodation provision program by the Department of Public Works. DPME has done implementation evaluation on this program to diagnose the key challenges and inform way forward on the provision of accommodation of state institutions. And the final report was released and is with the Department of Public Works. It shows must the challenges there in that space. But what is important, it has provided that report, the recommendations on how public works can improve so that government departments can be accommodated, government institutions can be accommodated and be able to work in a workspaces that are conducive for them to deliver in their, in the, in their uh, mandate. And then they, are, they have also done rapid evaluation of the fusion center program. And the aim was to assess its relevance, efficiency, effectiveness in addressing the cases of corruption fraud, money laundering. And that report has been now shared with the task team, the anti-corruption task team. This is quite a crucial report, the understanding that there's been outcry of corruption, uh, there's been outcry of fraud. So that evaluation is actually uh, making uh, recommendations that if taken forward, they could actually change the landscape in terms of how we gain Back the public trust in this area. They've also done a design in, 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 an implementation evaluation on e-governance strategy and its institutional as, as, uh, architecture so as to assess its appropriateness in improving public service delivery. So this, the report that came from this evaluation is going through the clusters. It has been presented to the GSCAT clusters and the proposed steps for coordinating just digital transformation are there in that report. And we hope that it will be able to be presented and into the cluster so that we see where we are going and what needs to be done in governance, in government so that we actually are at a level of other countries in terms of digital transformation. The other evaluation, perhaps the honorable members had to glance or heard about the very first edition of the COVID-19 country report. Now we are happy to report that we are in the second edition of the country report. I said from the lessons of the country report, we had to even change how we deal with the employee wellness strategy in the department. And uh, because we saw the extensiveness in terms of the impact of the COVID-19 uh, in, in, throughout the society. Now, the second edition has also been started and it's, it's extended to analyze now the measurement of the implementation of by government to alleviate the negative impact of COVID-19. So the research is still underway in this underway in this area and will be finalized in the next financial year in 2022-23. But because it is work that we started in this quarter that we are uh, reporting here in. So we thought we must also share that there is that work underway that will find its way also to the portfolio committee. Okay, I'm just moving to the next slide. Just as an example of showing um, so that the members can have a view without asking 
how does your work lead to results? I, we thought we must just extract from our, the PME report and just show how it all ties together and leads to results at the level of the citizens. So for instance, we take evaluations, evaluations and research and evaluations that we do or that have been done, they investigate a series of questions depending on the aim of the evaluation. Typically, the evaluations assess whether the design of the program and the way it's being implemented is actually unlikely to achieve its goals. Then evaluations proceed then to identify specific implementation challenges that program managers need to take into cognizance of and also correct. The same evaluations are done to assess whether the program is achieving its impact. And if not, what are the problems that are there and what must be done to, to, with those problems so that we improve uh, uh, impact? A standard practice is that the results of evaluations then they come with recommendations and the recommendations always say that the departments must develop improvement plans and then these improvement plans are integrated into the critical actions and these are found in departmental plans meaning therefore they address the shortcomings or whatever problems or challenges that have been identified through evaluations and through our programs we are interested in what citizens say to understand also their experiences so i we took an example for instance of the program for the program for of the frontline visits that the frontline visits were done in terms of the vaccination program uh, support and uh, on COVID-19. TPME conducted three rounds of frontline visit to assess the functionality and the performance of vaccination sites. And we've realized what was happening there we got findings and the findings from the assessments fed straight into the adaptive improvements that were introduced and at the implementation level right up to policy level. So it was DPME going there in the supporting of the vaccination program that was being you know, rolled out in dealing with COVID-19. And then once we gave the assessment, uh, the results of the assessment, they were then given at the levels from implementation level right up to policy level. As a result, provinces, provinces used the findings to actively implement specific improvements, working through the technical structures that are there under the Interministerial Committee on Vaccination that is chaired by the Deputy President. So it changed the picture and how we were dealing with the, peak, with the program of vaccination as a country through some of the visits that were done by DPME monitoring using the frontline visits. And we were able to see the results in improvement in vaccination rollout in the country. I just thought, let me make this example for the members to see, honorable members to see how the work translates into results in some areas. Now I would move to financial performance targets as quickly. Um, this is the first slide that talks to the compliance targets that we report on. All the departments must report on the payment of suppliers within 30 days as DPME will pay our service providers within three to four days. I will not go back to the PE score, uh, point scores. We are, we are expected is a compliance target to report on it. And I've talked to it uh, in terms of why, why it is being disputed and what we're going to do about that as a department. Moving quickly to the uh, um, budget, um, the P DM already stated that at the end of the third quarter by the 31st December with 59%. And I made a point that we are already in March and some of the projects because the PME budget is a really a 70% going to the COE and 30% going to our goods and services. And our major cost drivers have been programmed uh, two 
B and program five and program four. And those projects now are underway. And as we speak now, because our projects have been underway, we saw the budget was already at 80% as we were coming year to date as we we're coming here. And DM spoke to that. Uh, this slide just shows that the compensation of employees at that time, the expenditure was at 71% and the remaining, the remaining budget was 29%. And I would like to put it to the honorable members that it tallies with, it, it correlates with the vacancy rates that we were having or what that was slightly more than 5%, which was at 8%. And goods and services, goods and services, our expenditure was at 34% and I've already explained that. And uh, I would like to go to the slide actually that shows where the main reasons for variances. One, it will, it will show the members everything. The number one reason is the one that I've already talked to of the vacancy rate, that that expenditure correlates with the vacancy rate. The second one, goods and services, the understanding was 59.2 million and it was mainly due to the, 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 the consultants, uh, the, the one, the appointment of the commissioners. Commissioners were appointed much more later than uh, uh, expected or anticipated and that impacted in the expenditure. They were appointed only in December. And then the presidential hotline, uh, the invoices from the service provider from the end user were not received. Our, our norm within three days, once we receive the service provider, we pay. The indicator says payment after receiving the invoice from service provider. So the service, pro the, the end user was not submitting the invoices and that delayed the payment. And there is a huge amount of, this is one of the cost drivers in, in program four. So that expenditure delay uh, actually made us to have a, a quite um, a understanding in that space. The traveling, uh, whilst we expected uh, this 2021-22 year to be a year at least of a little bit mobility than the previous year, it showed that still we had less person-to-person uh, -person, uh, conduct meetings, face-to-face -face meetings, as well as training sessions, as well as workshops. We were still virtual, I mean, dictated to by the status of the, the infections at the country and uh, the, the regulation by DPSA in terms of, of how we can make contact. So that actually uh, got our travel expenses to remain uh, uh, untapped into, and it contributed to under expenditure. Status quo and remedial actions on targets not achieved. The BE scoring that I said is being disputed as DPME, we thought because this is a challenge for all government departments, we have taken an initiative to write to DTI for them to, re, to consider re-evaluation of the tool that is used in public sector for BE assessment. On the vacancy rate, we make the point that we had, because we are leaders in government in terms of planning, monitoring and evaluation, we wanted to make sure that we show uh, you know, by leadership that we can work around 5%, but we have learned for future pe pe planning purposes, we shall leave it uh, with the standard norm for government that is not less than 10%, so that when we achieve 5% or 7%, we are still within the norm. As I indicated earlier, it is because we move from the premise that even one or two people that are not within the organization, it affects the operations. That is what made us to set a very high standard for ourselves. We halved the norm for government, we put it at five, but that was a voluntary initiative by DPME. Presidential hotline that has not achieved, I've already talked that is they are going to come and present the improvement strategy to the committee. The procurement delays that the DM talked about, we've had information sessions, we have uh, looked at the governance structures within the department to make sure that procurement is, everything is now no longer going to be delayed. 
uh, and uh, CDMAS as a project that is one of the uh, huge cost drivers has progressed and it was at the bid evaluation stage as in February now as we, pre we presented today in March. The integrated planning framework bill, the service provider was also appointed and the project is now underway. The diagnostic research project also that was not appointed that caused the red when I was reporting under program 2B is also been awarded and is underway. Those were the three major cost drivers because of the amount of uh, budget allocated to those projects. And therefore moving of those projects have actually seen, especially the two have seen the begin the, the, the expenditure in the department. That is why DM was saying that we are now at 80%. In conclusion, DPME has achieved more than 70% of its target at the end of third quarter. But as we speak, departments have progressed up to 85, 85%. TPME is on course and is likely to achieve 95% of the planned targets. And we make the point that given the results that we've shared with the committee and the recommendations that were made when these reports were tabled at cabinet and, and here, the departments are you know, expected to implement improvement plans based on the recommendations so that we can see the change as a result of our monitoring and evaluation of government priorities. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, honorable members. Now the presentation is open for discussion. I see uh, honorable Nduli, honorable Kibi, and Honorable Mbele, Honorable Schreiber in that order, and Honorable Mutipe. Honorable Nduli, take the floor. Thank, thank you, Chairperson. Um, Chairperson, uh, hi, Nina and Yasle. Chairperson, uh, once again, I do have a problem with my video, but uh, Previously, you were seeing me, it will be better if that is so. Uh, chair and the meeting would love to welcome the presentation um, from DPME uh, and uh, it's so informative. And um, firstly, one would love to recognize that uh, the the NAPS, uh, NASP uh, baseline is very crucial. We applaud them to follow it to toe because uh, it shows that uh, it's not just in the jungle, lions are moving this way and elephants that way, gurus and so on. But it's in order, your constitution, your NDP, your policies, everything. Uh, my, my, my apology, uh, and And all and all, this uh, uh, presentation is 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 just reflecting work in progress. It is reflecting work in pro progress. But safe to say, Chair, the department still needs to push harder and higher. Uh, the department mentioned a number of monitoring. Uh, and as the portfolio committee, we are bleeding for more unannounced visits, including Department of Home Affairs. There is at no stage whereby you can uh, go past Home Affairs and there is no queue. Um, your DSD, if I can make an example, my constituency is a uh, at the two song and I happened to have the office of DSD together with me there. 
And at some stage, I had to to approach the office and ask. I've seen mothers uh, carrying babies, old people uh, uh, having arrived in the early mornings, but it was right in the afternoon, they were still there. And I had to approach the office and, and find out to say, uh, what, what's going on, what is happening? And really there are things that are, are beyond uh, the, 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 the people on the ground in, the, in their offices. For instance, they mentioned that, uh, yes, they are working, but uh, when it's half past four, the computer just halt. That means if you've been in the queue since morning and now it's half past four, the computer halts and you are not going to get any assistance. For, for us, maybe uh, to, to, to join hands on such issues, because it's not, it's not saying the, 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 the SD office is working, they are working, but there are long queues. But if you sit down with them, do your monitoring and come coming up with your strategies, maybe it can work. Your police stations, you go there, you are, you are told there is only one van. If it's out, uh, there is this and that, your understaffing and so on and so forth. Um, your hospitals, uh, people uh, 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 sitting on the benches from morning, uh, 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 till 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 very late but i want to keep on emphasizing the work in progress and pushing harder and pushing higher um but chair in terms of the vacancies that uh, the vacancy rate that uh, was mentioned one would also want to hit the to say, I think it's high time that they, they must have their own sort of strategy for the various uh, uh, causes of these um, uh, 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 vacancies. For instance, if, if it's the people that are retiring within the department, what do, what do the department do and how and when? So that when the time comes for those people that are retiring, already uh, the, 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 the new posts are in the pipeline. Um, of course, there are vacancies that are caused by unforeseen circumstances is beyond uh, everyone, uh, everyone uh, is uh, uh, any, uh, take there, but to try and and lower down because to say we are within the norms and standards of the uh, of the government really might not talk to the people on the ground because for me uh, much as we appreciate the work for me if there is a position if there is an office that it's not occupied and there's a, another office that is doubling the job, it might along the way jeopardize the, 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 the work. Um, so try by all means to see to it that uh, it is um, a really a, 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 um, done uh, away with and the uh, you mentioned the, the 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 poverty lines that are very they are looking very low and uh, please on that one we applaud um, you uh, because elimination of poverty is is a major challenge poverty is still a a major challenge, particularly to our people on the ground, uh, 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 and 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 more especially to the previously disadvantaged people. So, in terms of poverty, we will 
really want to see the elimination of poverty by your monitoring and evaluation and the strategies to be really a, 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 a seen. But again, the present, uh, the non-compliance, the non-compliance, um, we get the sense as to how are, are you tackling it, your posture and the approach to it. But, but uh, we feel strongly that uh, uh, we sh at this age and time, we shouldn't be talking about the uh, non-compliance because your, your measures that you put down should be talking to everyone no delays of, of, of payments, et cetera, and so forth. And uh, to the present presidential hotline, of course, uh, we understand your turnaround strategy around it, but we are saying push harder and higher on this one, because this is the hope of the nation. Uh, that's where people, uh, uh, um, that is the last resort of the people on the ground. To say, if I, I use the presidential hotline, I know that is the last uh, office uh, 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 in the country. Uh, I do want to really commend and applaud your work, but pushing harder and pushing higher uh, remains for, for, for me. Thank you, Chair. Honorable Kibi. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Let me welcome and appreciate the report by DPME. Uh, Honorable Chair, let me also align myself with the Honorable and Tuli on the issue of non-compliance. It seems as if the issue, the matter of non-compliance, uh, it seems to be a challenge. And it is a matter that is uh, cross-cutting in the public service. Is the department monitoring the issue of non-compliance in the public service? provided it's a monitoring responsibility. And can we expect a report within that, within, within that regard, or will it be part of the frontline service delivery program? My next one is throughout uh, the presentation, uh, you, are, you make a reference to impact where targets have been achieved to 100%. What impact has been made? What are the vis visible changes that we, we can see? And uh, the, the, my next one, Honorable Chair, would be, does the department have any disciplinary cases in 2021-2022 financial years? If yes, how long does the labor relations process take to finalize the disciplinary cases in the department? In terms of slide 20, the department has indicated that there is a report on monitoring NDP indicators. Can the uh, national uh, planning uh, program through the department provide the monitoring report of NDP indicators to the committee. My last one is, does this monitoring report comprise of high level indicators to measure performance of MTSF uh, chapters of the NDP? I thank you, Honorable Chair. Honorable Bell. Um, uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Chairperson, um, and thank you for the presentation from the departments. Um, just two, two inputs or two responses uh, from my side. 
Um, the first that obviously the, the key point that was made in the presentation, um, and it's not a new one, is that the problem has not been with planning uh, per se, but it's with implementation. Uh, we've heard that many times uh, in, in committee deliberations as, as well as um, speeches in the House, um, and which I would argue is specifically about ensuring accountability enforcement uh, for, for performance outcomes. And, and obviously the evaluation reports of the departments are the key mechanism for that. So my question is, what is the process that is actually meant to be followed after the production of those evaluation reports um, in order that the findings and outcomes and, and contents of those evaluations or assessments then start to make a corrective impact on performance going forward? Um, and, and, and where is that value chain breaking down? Because clearly the evaluation reports are being produced and they're coming out, but we're not seeing the, the, the proportionate um, uh, positive uh, influence over time. Uh, you know, for example, I would have assumed that those kind of reports would go to the president who would use them as a basis for um, performance discussions with, with cabinet ministers and with DGs. Um, and then systemically, chronic underperformers either receive uh, performance management interventions to improve performance, or they're progressively worked out of the system. So I'm just trying to build up and see the, the, the big clear picture of where things are breaking down in the aftermath of the evaluation reports, given that we're not seeing uh, uh, that influence happening um, in the final performance outcomes of, of, of departments and, and, the, and the people who are at the top of that. And then my second point, Che, is more of a comment, is that you know, from the external uh, socioeconomic indicators that were, that were in the presentation, we are seeing a picture of uh, chronic, and in some cases, intensifying stagnation, if not outright regression, and the kind of outcomes we'd like to see, and which the which both the the, the NDP and the MTSF uh, um, have have set out as being what we're looking for. You know, uh, slide thirty four. We see that growth, investment, and employment are down, and they are way subpar to what we need to achieve developmental um, ambitions. Uh, slide thirty six uh, concedes that. The, 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 the prerequisites for successful implementation of the NDP did not fully materialize. And one of those prerequisites is the so-called social compacts that the president has been proposing and announcing for three, three or four years now. Um, but we, we've seen that there's little meaningful movement on that front. So mine is just to, to raise an urgent alarm that the seeming snowballing downward slide from stagnation to regression to what seems in, in, in some cases to be a systemic failure does happen much quicker than anyone ever expects. And at some points, it's going to become irreversible once too many skills and resources have been depleted. So at this midpoint of the MTSF period, there either really needs to be bold and radical U-turn or you know, starting to turn the ship. Um, otherwise, it's going to be locked in on a on a not so happy course that's, that ends in a, in a situation that not, none of us would find desirable. Uh, thank you, Chair. Honorable Schreiber. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, my question uh, uh, latches on to what the Honorable, Honorable Mbele has said. Um, slides 34 and 35 specifically, um, that table showing the outcome uh, on targets, yeah, if we, if we could just put that up, perhaps that would be useful. Um, just maybe 34 is, is okay. Yeah, there it is at, at the top. One more up, please. Up one more. There we go. So, Che, I mean, I think this is where, uh, as one of the officials said, the rubber meets the road. Um, these are the measurements 
that South Africans are looking at. These are the outcomes that they care about. And uh, much else in the presentation uh, involves targets and goals that are supposed to get us to improve uh, these outcomes and to reach those uh, targets set by the NDP. But Chair, if we interrogate this slide, it is really an extremely alarming slide. And it comes at, a, at an appropriate time because we are a little bit more than halfway through this MTSF period now leading up to 2024. And if you look at these indicators, it seems to me that every single one of them is heading in the wrong direction. And some of them quite, quite shockingly, the unemployment rate, the number of people employed, investment as a percentage of GDP, growth, all of these things should set the alarm bells ringing. So my question is a very concise one, Chair. Halfway through the MTSF period, given this extraordinary regression on all of these major outcome targets, does the department uh, think that the government is currently failing and has failed halfway through the MTSF period? Thank you very much, Chair. Honorable Mzipe. Thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. I don't want to repeat what my colleagues have already uh, said, uh, but I've got the comments here saying that now that the COVID-19 is fading away, and then the committee is expecting full accountability, those duplications and other challenges uh, need to be proper and quality, meaning that uh, Really, the department must have now the full 32 teeth to bite in order to fix and everything now. And then the vacancy rate needs to be broken down according to department and target that you have achieved or you increased. That must be specified so that we can see where might the challenge be in order to assist you do not generalize issues, especially on fraud and corruptions. And then the question is, does the department, uh, does the delays of providing invoices late, does you have the consequences for that? And then how, if you don't have or how are you going to deal with those departments that are bringing the invoices late? Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Honorable Mkweba. No, thank you very much, Chair. And one, uh, let me acknowledge the presentation by the department. In fact, uh, Chair, I've been covered in many questions, but I've got only three questions to the department. One, I in slide, uh, I think 27, I've picked up, they are speaking about the ICT. So my question to the department chair is that, um, how has the ICT been strategically positioned to capture, to cope with the trends of supporting employees? And the second question chair in the presentation again, uh, the department spoke about the tool utilized by the private sector. So my question to the department, Chair, why the department reliant on private sector instead of its internal monitoring and evaluation tool? And lastly, Chair, we understand that we are at a time where the unemployment is at its peak and uh, I'm also puzzled about uh, the, the high vacancy rate uh, in all our departments while we're experiencing such challenge, Chair. And my question then to the department, what is prohibiting our departments to fill this vacancy post, Chair? Thank you. Honorable Malomani. Thank you, Honorable Chair. I've tried to open my video, but I think I don't know whether is it, I can't see it. But can you allow me to continue, Chair? 
Honorable Chair. Continue. You can continue. I can also see you on the. Okay. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Greetings to everyone. Let me also join my colleagues in welcoming the presentation from DPME. I was also covered in many questions, but what I want to add is the issue on the issue of uh, the vacancy rate, because if you can check also in the presentation, the number of the, in the number of employment, it was 16.3 million and currently is 14.9, which is uh, the difference, which is huge when it comes to taking of the employees that are no more in the system. So I just want to find out what makes the departments not to fill this position or what it prohibits them not to fill the positions, especially those who are those of the critical post. The other thing that I want to check is the issue of their targets that they were not achieved. Is there anything that they, or any target that had been moved to the fourth quarter? If so, can they state so that when it comes to the fourth quarter, maybe we'll see their report when they will be overachieving instead of their target. So I just wanted to find out, is, is there any plan of those that they were not achieved the targets to be moved maybe to the fourth quarter or to the next financial year? Thank you, Chair. Honorable McClure. Thank you so much, uh, Chairperson. I, I also want to join uh, my colleagues in appreciating this, this, this report, it is indeed a member task, especially in the midst of a, 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 a entity which we are dealing with who do, who do not have a portfolio committee in the presidency. We talk about uh, evaluation programs here. We talk about conducting programs of, 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 of government here. And we are all aware that these programs also guide the efficacy uh, to the broader citizens of South Africa. Now, when it comes to this evaluation reports, it also affects quite a number of, 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 of committees within parliament. And uh, these committees can be utilized or can be seen as the one and only tool uh, in uh, the legislature to debate and also affect decision-making processes within parliament. Now, I want to, 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 to ask a, a, a question uh, to this department. Is there any, anything that prevents them? It's a, it's a very direct question uh, to the, this department to share this evaluation reports with parliament, uh, also uh, to share it with the respective committees in order for them, when it comes to us as politicians and our oversight role, to play our part uh, uh, in the specific arena, because uh, you know some of our colleagues has referred to uh, regression. We uh, one colleague referred to hospital lines, clinics, and and police stations. So it is imperative that these reports be sent to the respective committees, and I would like them to respond to this, whether they uh, uh, consider doing this in order for those committees to deal with their uh, oversight. Thank you, Chair. Honorable Kibi. Thank you, thank you, Honorable Chair. Thanks for giving me again. Honorable Chair, there's one other question that I've missed. Uh, with regards to the development of the budget prioritization framework, this target was not achieved in 2021-22 financial year. Now, uh, does the government really need this framework since the role of budget allocation is the responsibility of the national treasury through cabinet and parliament? Does the department involve the national treasury at the conceptualization stage when developing the budget prioritization uh, framework and lastly does the framework inform the budget allocations of the national treasury process thank you honorable chair thank you honorable uh, kibi 
Uh, I now hand over to the department to reply to the questions that the honorable members have asked. Thank you, Chair. Let's allow uh, officials to respond and I'll come at the tail end. Dr. Tsiki and your team. Uh, NPC also, mm -hmm. please be ready on other side. Thank you. Thank you very much, TM. Uh, uh, let I will allow the uh, colleagues, the, the DDGs, to respond as the as the DM has um, directed. Let me. I would like to first clarify the issue of non-compliance, and I think perhaps it's not coming out clearly when it says non-compliance is a is a problem. No, we we are complying as the PME. This is a compliance target that everyone must score 30% in the BE through their procurement, the score. Then we are then making a point that the tool, the measurement tool that has been used throughout the public service has resulted in government departments not being able to achieve the score of 30% they achieve less because this tool, the assessment tool, measurement tool, is actually asking questions in the government departments, questions that are applicable in the private sector. I'd like the honorable members to get clarity on that. It is not that we are not complying as DPMP, and I would like it to be at the, on the record as such. We are at reporting on the target, we are complying. We are not scoring, we are not getting the score. We are getting less than the score because of the tool, the measurement tool they are using. Not only DPME is getting low score, other government departments too. That is why Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation in monitoring has seen that this is a challenge across government and taken an initiative to write to DTI. I hope this is clear. The second uh, question is, can we provide the monitoring reports to the portfolio committee? Um, the, certainly, we always want to make information available. And I think towards the end, Honorable uh, Mark Glua makes a point that once the recommendations have been made from evaluations, the departments have got a responsibility to uptake those recommendations. And therefore the leadership in those departments, meaning therefore the DG, the accounting officer must ensure that those recommendations are integrated into improvement plans if we, they are to change in those departments. So Honorable Magula is so on point in that it should be monitored across other committees that you were given these recommendations to change around in this area of your work. Your work is not improving. You are not implementing the recommendation, the recommendations. They must then be made to account. That would actually assist the, the department in monitoring, but it would assist also just the oversight to know that these areas have been identified, the department have been given what to do, but it's just the department that is not moving in the space to, to, to effect. The, the changes so that they can perform better. So I then think that uh, the PME, the evaluation reports can be provided to those uh, that must come to, to, to the committee, uh, but there's DTG for evaluations who will also add to that. Then the, the, the question about, the, uh, it came from Honorable Bailey, that the problem has always been about implementation. And I think this we see as, as government, that is why I really support also the question that came from the honorable member who said, it's better that we be seen there at the front line, there in these places, examples were made of home affairs, examples were made of hospitals with the long queues. Mon Frontline monitoring has been to those areas and then they make recommendations 
because the situation is seen that this is not conducive to the citizens of the country. The police vehicles that arrive long after the time in, in cases of emergency or when needed, the recommendations are made. It is now the sector departments, the, the accounting officers in the sector departments that must make sure that they implement the recommendations. And often they, they would argue on the budget and the what, but it is important that at, at all levels, there is a monitoring to see that the recommendations are implemented if we are to see the change that we want to, to see. The, also, there should be, a, um, this, I think Honorable Mbele made the point that they should be going to the president and ministers' agreements. Because uh, Honorable Mbele, I want to state for the fact that the leadership of the departments, the management, they get the, the results. And often in the space of evaluations, globally, the challenge has always been those who are given recommendations and their appetite to uptake the recommendations. So when they talk about the, the, no, them not having budget to effect a certain recommendation, that talks to their appetite of wanting to change in the space where they are told they need to change. They need to change costs, which I think it makes a point that these recommendations must come also to the portfolio committee so that these departments, when they come with underperformance in these areas, let's make an example. If the public works come still with a challenge in office accommodation, mentioning a myriad of reasons why they can provide decent and uh, a conducive accommodation, yet the evaluation has been done and the way forward given, they should be taken to task. And uh, I also just want to answer the, the, the issue of the filling uh, of the vacancies that uh, was raised by the Honorable. I, I had indicated that unfortunately in the order that we are reporting at DPME, we had deaths due to COVID. We, we had uh, really, uh, compared to other departments, interestingly, we had those deaths that contributed to the vacant positions, although we also had a few resignations. So we try to make sure that we keep the vacancy rate as soon as positions are vacant. We advertise, we fill them. Um, there, 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 there has also been the issue of the funds that were taken by Treasury for some of the positions and then those positions, we had to find means, means of shifting from other positions to the other. There was a time in 2021, Treasury took the project and reduced the, 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 the compensation of employees budget. But we had to find a way of moving around uh, from some positions to others, to, to the critical areas to make sure that there's human capacity, but that, is still a, a constraint that is there in the department. But the reporting period that what contributed to the 8% was the deaths and the resignations. Um, then the, I would then allow D -D -D -D, uh, Dr. Masting to talk about what's coming out of the NDP and what can be done with those indicators, given that we are midway and uh, what is saying to uh, South African, uh, I would like her to, to respond to that as well as DDG Mahomo. And then I would like DDG for um, evaluations to add if there is something that you would like to add about the recommendations and how they need to find themselves in front of the president and the ministers to actually influence the agreements and the, the work, the performance assessment of the ministers. Thank you very much. Thank you, you can take the floor. Thank you very much, uh, honorable chair and thanks to the DM and the presenters. I think on the issue of whether the NPC reports can be discussed in with parliament, 
Uh, these reports are available and they can be used to create that dialogue, that debate, as well as a conversation that can also even assist in working with parliament to try and understand how we can then outside this reporting ensure that there's a conversation about the improvements towards implementation of the national development plan as a plan of the country and therefore the results that arise from the work of the national planning commission should also be able to come and create this environment where the discourse can be created firstly to ensure that the understanding is that the national development plan continues in the remaining decade to 2030 as a plan of the country and when implementation is measured the role and the participation and the contribution of private sector, civil society, and government as a leading entity should be able to be understood so that when we measure progress, we don't only say it's because government has failed. It is because more work needs to be done and implementation of the national development plan should be done in the next years towards 2030. As a whole of society, all social partners should be able to play their part and working with parliament, I think the NPC can be able to create a dialogue that can strengthen implementation by all of us going forward. Secondly, yes, the reports are there and they can be shared with parliament and even meetings can be created where the dialogue can be provided for. Thank you very much. Uh, who's the next? Yeah, I will ability. come in. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying but... to see myself on the screen. There, there. My name is Mahomo Chatsinde. I'm the DDG for sector monitoring. Um, let me greet uh, uh, honorable chair and honorable members and uh, my honorable uh, DM and colleagues. Uh, and start by saying, I pride in the 100% achievement of my targets. Because if I can't do that, there is no way we can have the mirror which you see today in terms of performance of government, performance of the country. So the slide 34 and the slide 36 we are talking about, those are my slides, you know, which are you know, the outcomes of this, that. We talked a lot about that and we talked about then when you go to slide 36, we actually cascade it in terms of the priorities of government, those seven priorities and how they affect the slides which are up there, you know, the higher order, which is, uh, you know, uh, uh, measuring unemployment, inequality and, um, uh, uh, and poverty. So, you, you know, you wouldn't be able to have that. This is a high order. Once we are talking about the apex ones, Let's go to those red ones and the yellow ones. You wouldn't be having this picture. And this picture, we brought it here to empower parliament to assist us you know, in terms of the monitoring which we are doing, because we are also an oversight. And I'm very excited to hear that you want to come to our spaces and be able to assist us, because it's a, it's a mammoth of a task. And, and if I don't uh, make sure that my team including the team of GPME and those who are supporting us, including, you know, they, they we use a lot of information from states, SA and uh, many organizations, even, even uh, quite a number of uh, uh, the, the, the organizations which, which, are, which are doing research and evaluations as well to come to this point, because it's not only about government departments, it's about the country at large. So we need to bring everybody, everybody, you know, to this space from, to ensure that our country goes forward. This is my pride, 100%. This is my discomfort to show this kind of a, you know, a, a, you know, a, a picture, you know, of the country. And after I've done so much work. So in terms of the reports, the reports are there. Uh, we started to, 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 to make certain that these reports are published. They are in our DPME website. Quite a number of uh, gov, you know, uh, uh, parliamentary members, they actually asked for them and have sent them to them. They are using them. 
uh, uh, you know, the universities are using them, everybody's using this, you know, because they are public. And when you go to the, our website, you find the narrative the analytical reports and all the indicators and how we've measured them and, and all the challenges which you find themselves ourselves in and also where we've done well. And then, so they are really uh, in-depth analysis which has done, I, I, which, which we've done there. So, and I, 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 I like my, my work, if I put an effort into it, to be utilized because the, what's the point of doing all this work and then it's hidden you know, somewhere else. So what happens in the process? Somebody asked about the process. In a, a, a month ago, we, we went to cabinet, you know, to, to do our, I think it's our fourth, is our second this, uh, this, uh, this, this year, but it's our fourth since the, the beginning of this uh, sixth administration. So, uh, you know, a report. So you will find uh, four sets of um, this information. So when it comes from cabinet and is approved at cabinet, we are allowed to publish uh, the reports and then they are, go, they are in the DPME website. If the current aren't there yet, if they are not yet there yet, they will be you know, as a matter of uh, not long, but the previous ones are there. I've checked them, they are there, you know, in the, in the, in the website and everybody is, is, a, is a, a welcome to ask from myself or from the, our communication or go directly into our website to, to download them, you know, per priority, the seven of these per priority. So when it comes to, you know, whether we can share with the parliament, Parliamentary committees invite us, actually, when they go for the performance of departments, every department, we are there, we're given the space to talk about how the MTSF translates from the NDP, MTSF translates to the APP, and how each one of these feed into each other. So each, each and every one of the departments, when they do their annual reports, even now, we, you know, with the third quarter reports and so on, we have been invited to various departments, you know, to share with, with, the, with the departments. And then we also work with several committees, the, the, the clusters, we work with departments, you know, you know, every time on this. So in terms of, uh, um, you know, whether we do follow through, yes, we've got uh, improvement plans. And uh, uh, this time round, the president, you know, uh, requested that he, you know, him and the minister want to make control of this uh, improvement plans so that, uh, you know, they are certain that they are not falling within the gaps because they are put back into, you know, into the work of the various departments, you know, that, and then we, we assess them before we assess the next uh, level of, of assessment. So what we're doing right now, we're busy with the, with the, um, with the letters, with the, um, the recommendations which were coming from, from cabinet, we received the minutes, the recommendations which were made, recommendations coming from the cabinet, and also the, the remedial actions which need to be done. So we're, we're writing those letters which the president asked us to do to, do to various cabinet ministers and the departments as, as such. For, 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 for this to be operational, we are also doing that on our level with the, with the various departments and, and we will be including the, the outcomes of the, the progress made in terms of the remedial actions in our reporting processes going forward. And this, this gives us a, a hold into the, the continuousness of monitoring and the sharpening of, of that, uh, that tool, which uh, we were requested by parliament that we must make sure that it is, it is uh, sharpened. Yes, we go and do case studies as well. And then we, we basically have been to most of these places, which we have some of the, the places which we, we were told. Uh, we, which which we, we, we talked about here, police station is like, in our reports, you'll find those key studies and then what we're doing about that you know, in, in, in strengthening our teeth into, into monitoring. Uh, my honorables, I can go on and on and on, but and I'm very pleased that you are now going to be helping us, you know, with this mammoth of the task of monitoring and also evaluating and ensuring that implementation takes place and that we get better results for, for, for the sake of our country going forward. Thank you very much. Chair. Thank you. Thank it's you. your term now, DM. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. 
unless if uh, Dr. Mashamba wanted to say something. But in the overall, I think um, we have we have covered most of the the issues that members um, have raised, and I know um, in the from the planning and coordination unit, which uh, Dr. Grizel is uh, is leading, we will be coming back to the portfolio committee on the NASP, how we we align from the NDP to the MTSF, the NASP, the APP. And treasury becomes important because you cannot plan, identify priorities, and all those should be costed and be budgeted for. Now, part of what we are also going to do, you know departments have elements of saying the baseline, this is how much we want and so on and so on. But what we also need to do through portfolio committees is to say, is your baseline still relevant because from time to time you surrender money just before the end of the financial year? Which programs of government have been surrendering money for the past three years? Which portfolios are they still relevant and so on? So that's why the planning and coordination unit. It's now looking at the totality of issues and whether everything that departments will be bringing speaks to the national development plan, the priorities and so on. So we, we're not going to move. So the two outer years that are remaining, which is 2022, 23, 23, 24, you will see in a big way the shift um, because that's what um, Dr. Grizel has been has been looking at. Now, the other element, which is also which we want the portfolio committee to be close to, the planning commission is in place. We are going to Lekhotla with them and and plan everything. Uh, it's it's um, ready. And just after that, it's through you. So your hand, your hand can go up. Please mute, mute, please mute. So through the portfolio committee, there's going to be stakeholder engagement by the planning commission. So parliament is one of the stakeholders. There's going to be dialogues with citizenry, various uh, institutions um, and, and um, you know, stakeholders, business and all these things. So parliament is also going to be one of the, the, the engagement that the planning commission is going to have. So they'll share some of the things, the gaps that they are identifying, how we're going to turn the situation around going to 2030. So that's, that's one of the things that they'll also do. I like the fact that members are also saying um, uh, you know, the observations that members are, are seeing through their constituency offices. And Honorable Julie was also talking about the backlogs, uh, long queues in post offices and so on. I'm calling on members to also join us because we're now robustly going into the frontline monitoring, sector monitoring. I was in the in the free state last week, one of the things that was hitting, and we were three DMs there, DM police, DM um, uh, justice, and myself, because we were looking at why do we have GBV in one region at 170 people and 110 are young people below the age of 80. And when we arrived there, one young girl was raped when she was six and the court is still taking place the, the girl is 12 years how do you remember something that happened uh, when you were six and you are, you are now 12 years so this kind of uh, frontline monitoring help us to start to look at the agility of government without us interfering and making um, other sector departments to, to really um, circumvent certain processes. But we're saying 
really some of these things are, are a cause for consent. So the portfolio committee can join us or on your own do uh, your, your own, but it will be nicer if we stepped first start with you so that um, the, the, the units are able to show you from the research capacity they have done. And then in the next round, you can go on your own independently so that you do those kind of monitoring. We're doing all these things in an integrated manner with various departments so that all of us as DMs go there in the front line and say, what are the bottlenecks? What is it that you want us to help you with? So thank you very much, uh, honorable members. We will be coming back to you on progress reports, including the presidential hotline and other interventions and updates that you want us to do. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, um, DM Kekan and your team. Let me now invite the um, Statistician General. Thank you indeed, the uh, chairperson. And uh, let me thank uh, uh, the members of uh, uh, parliament honorables that are, are leading us into today's discussions. But let me also thank our uh, 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 Deputy Minister, who is leading us uh, from the side of the executive, and indeed uh, uh, for uh, the responsibility that herself, Minister, and uh, uh, Deputy Ministers where I have uh, on us on generally on matters of our work. Chairperson, uh, we are going to take uh, members of Parliament uh, through our presentation. And as we do so for quarter one, two, and three, and as we do so, obviously we have submitted uh, the, the report and the details sits in the report. But as we do so, we will uh, pick up the highlights uh, uh, that uh, um, we think in the time that uh, we are allocated, we can be able to uh, cover. When we look at the overview, of uh, our presentation, we are going to speak uh, to issues of uh, uh, the strategic overview, uh, and then we are going to talk to organizational performance from uh, the side of what is it that we have achieved. We are going to talk to human resources performance. We are going to talk to uh, financial performance and we are going to lift ourselves to key achievements. And once we go through those key achievements, then we will go straight to uh, strategic risks, which we always share with parliament uh, from time to time, Chairperson. Let me say at this point in time that we will start with the vision of State SA and say that we seek to improve lives through data ecosystems. But what we look at is the whole issue of uh, the production of statistics and coordination of use of statistics. We want to drive it through optimization, innovation, and partnerships. And in this regards, we are looking at strategic outcomes. We will remember previously uh, our strategic outcomes looked at issues of growing the economy, the social harmony, cohesion, and the like. But in our new strategy, which this parliament has approved as of the year 2020, 2020, uh, 2020 2021, uh, looks at strategic outcomes in the form of uh, uh, insightful data, agile operating model, uh, integrated, interconnected statistical systems and transformed capabilities. Chairperson, when we look at uh, our actual performance as an organization, we look at it in relation to what we said we would uh, produce in the year 2021, 2022. We said we would make available 
48 statistical reports. Uh, those are releases, reports that were scheduled for this year in the area of education and skills, unemployment and job creation, health and vital events, poverty, inequality, and population dynamics, housing and access to basic service, uh, service delivery, governance, crime, and public safety. Furthermore, we said that we would have 228 statistical releases on the side of measuring the economy. And in this regard, Chair, we said that we would uh, make available issues of economic performance from the side of the GDP, and uh, we would actually deal with issues of uh, price stability, and uh, these include, amongst other issues, the CPI and the uh, um, issues of PPI, pro uh, producer price indices. We would talk uh, uh, of releases and uh, uh, reports on financial performance of government and uh, private sector, the primary, secondary, and tertiary sector. We would talk about environmental and agricultural statistics, tourism, and transport. Chairperson, furthermore, we have actually uh, uh, come to report about our performance. And in this regard, as uh, coming to our performance, we are saying that in quarter one, we reached 94% of our performance in that 64 of our planned targets were reached. Now, Chairperson, when we talk about targets, it's because when we talk about measuring the society and measuring the economy, uh, we, our targets include those monthlies that we have to release in terms of manufacturing, electricity, that is generally utilities, but largely electricity, in terms of uh, other areas of uh, mining and the like. Now, 64 of our planned targets were achieved in quarter one, which uh, put our target at uh, our performance at 94%. 68 of our planned targets were achieved in quarter two, which put our performance at 96%. As of quarter three, 79 of our planned targets were achieved, which put our performance at uh, uh, 96%. Let us look at human resources performance, Chairperson. Human resources performance, our vacancy sits at 18%. And in these three quarters, we have lost 84 staff members. And when we talk about 84 staff members, uh, the uh, chairperson and honorable members, uh, we will remember that we have always presented before this committee that we are losing uh, between 20 and 26 staff members per quarter. And these staff members are demanded by banks, they are demanded by international agencies. And uh, the offers they get are much more higher <clears throat> that it's very difficult to have to match in terms of counter offers because sometimes they are offered two times up to four times the salary that they are earning. And uh, uh, no amount of <clears throat> uh, encouragement in the form of training programs that we offer them can keep them. We do uh, at, uh, certainly at times uh, uh, encourage them and tie them down by the uh, schemes that we offer them for training. But as we do tie them down by the training programs, those who offer uh, them jobs are willing to uh, buy them out and sometimes at no cost to themselves, which makes it easier for them to saunter out of the organization. Our staff with disabilities still sitting at 1.2%. And indeed, as we uh, continue to hire, this is an area we are uh, particularly paying attention to. Women in SMS, uh, our women in SMS, we will remember we're sitting at 41% previously. We have dropped to 40.1% because of resignations. 
uh, because uh, as people resign, uh, we haven't been able to uh, replace particularly uh, in this area uh, 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 of uh, numbers that would push us to 41%, partly because one, amongst others, the people who have resigned sit in positions that as we reprioritize, our focus now is to look largely at operational level uh, to stabilize the production of statistics, a point that we'll talk to later when we talk about protecting uh, uh, basic statistics. But also the other issue is that other than the statistician general, the other people that have been hired in the last 10 years, uh, some of them in the last five years or uh, uh, up until 2016, are permanent positions. So when you have members of SMS sitting at 41% and uh, you are having people who are permanent, until they resign or retire, you are usually stuck with that unless you can grow the organization at levels of SMS. And because now uh, our biggest challenge is stabilizing the production of statistics, at levels that are at operational level, which is lower than SMS, it's becoming very difficult to grow the organization at the top. Having said so, I want us to look at a population groups. And when we look at population groups, I want us to look firstly on the right hand side of the table and say that according to our statistics, about 81% to be exact, 80.9% of South Africans are African, uh, Black African. 7.7% are colored, 8.8% are white, and 2.7% are Indian Asian. But when you come to Stets SA, and I want us to start from the left-hand side. 89% are Black African, 5.5% are colored, 4.3% uh, are uh, white, Indian Asian 1.2%. But when we come to SMS, we can see that the Black Africans are dropping by about 20 percentage points to be sitting at 67%. The colors are actually uh, rising uh, a, a few more uh, uh, points in terms from staffing, general staffing in the organization, whereas generally in, uh, we haven't met the target of uh, your, uh, their share on the South African side in SMS. Your white population group is sitting at 17.2%, uh, almost double of what you have as of the country share of the population group. So it's the same with the Indian Asian sitting at SMS at 9.4%, which is about three times higher than what you have as a share of a uh, national population uh, 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 size. Now, let us come to look in terms of uh, females versus males in state SA. On the uh, uh, pie chart, we can see that there are more females in state SA, 54% versus 46% male. But when we come to SMS, we have an anomaly where there are more males sitting at about 59.9%, uh, that is about 60%, and females sitting at 40.1%, that is about 40%. So we actually have a larger drop, and this is a matter that needs attention. But as it needs attention, uh, it becomes more challenging when uh, we are sitting with permanently employed people, and people in statistical agencies, not only in states, they say, tend to stay, stay long. So those people that we have hired about uh, 10, 20 years ago are still here, and until they retire, uh, we will be making a uh, slow progress in this regard. Let us look at uh, the uh, uh, programs in terms of our programs, how uh, we are faring as regards uh, this matter in the next slide, Celia. 
Uh, we are saying that uh, women in SMS, as we have indicated at the top, we are sitting at 40.1%, but generally, uh, it's only in the population and social statistics where we are sitting at 62.5% and 50% uh, in the uh, South African at the bottom, that is South African national statistics system. In the other components, we are actually uh, falling far below 50%, the most affected being statistical operations and provincial coordination sitting at 28.9%. Uh, now we want to look at the age cohorts. We have uh, our staff complement picking at uh, ages 49, uh, 40 to 49 years, whereas 20 to 29 is 1%, uh, 30 to 39 years sitting at 25.8%, and indeed in terms of 50 to 59, 19%, and 20 uh, at 60 to 65, 2.6%. So the bulk of our staff members are in the 40 to 49 years. It's because staff members in Stats SA tend to stay long, Chairperson. Uh, and, uh, and in this regard, I mean, those that I serve with in management, none of them have less than 24 years uh, uh, in Stats SA. The majority of us uh, sitting at about 26, 27 years, or even more in Stats SA. Now, uh, uh, having said so, let us look at the uh, different uh, vacancy rates as they sustain in the organization. We can see that uh, statistical operations and provincial coordination is sitting at 13%, that is the lowest, uh, and uh, with 191 vacancies. This is where our operations are happening in the provinces. So it's not necessarily SMS, but this includes uh, operational people. And we are sitting uh, not, 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 not lowest, my apologies. Let me say that they are sitting lowest in terms of their share uh, of uh, 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 what's that of uh, 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 percentages of vacancies. Whereas when we look, they have the highest share in terms of absolute numbers, because that's where our operations are happening. But uh, economic statistics, which is also a small component, the uh, vacancy rate is 15%, which comes to about 82%. But the other components are sitting at higher shares. And let us look at the sums. It's 48%, whereas its actual share of absolute numbers is 22%. So all in all, our vacancy rate is sitting at 18% with a total of 559 staff members. Our discussions with National Treasury, even with funding, which I'll talk to at the end, doesn't look like we'll get all these staff members. So we have to reprioritize and get the critical posts. I will come to this point towards the end. Now, let us look at uh, staff members with disability. Uh, only two components are relatively higher than the 2% uh, that is set at national average. That is administration at 2.2% and statistical support at 3.8%. The others are actually falling a lot more lower uh, with uh, the SAMS that is as, as South African national statistical systems, which uh, doesn't have a single person with disability at the stage. Now, let us look at financial performance. In terms of financial performance, according to uh, our performance, we are sitting uh, at, at, at different levels, but let me start with uh, at the invoices. Uh, we used to be doing very well prior to COVID. We used to be sitting at 100% of invoices paid within 30 days. But uh, coming back to uh, the COVID environment, we have fallen uh, to levels of 98.3% in the first quarter, 98.9% in the second quarter, 99.3% in the third quarter. And largely, this is due to the fact that when we get invoices, we cannot pay invoices until uh, the suppliers have given us all the documents we need. 
and uh, suppliers usually will not give us all in a uh, document. And uh, we have had cases of them sometimes even calling the presidential hotline. And uh, uh, still, we cannot pay until we have all documents because this is an auditable issue. But in terms of performance by program, our total spend is sitting at 49%, almost 50%, but it's weighed down by program seven and program six. But largely in program six is where our census is. And the bulk of our field workers are actually in field as of now, because we will remember all our tests, particularly tests in person, were disrupted uh, during the, uh, the, the waves, the previous waves. The last wave we had was the third wave of COVID-19, where we had to take a decision not to deploy field workers uh, into the field to test, but particularly mainly uh, in KwaZulu-Natal and the Western Cape, where during our tests, we were hit the highest, uh, or there were the last two provinces lagging behind when it comes to COVID-19. Uh, so now that we have our field workers in the field, uh, certainly we will see movements as we move to the uh, fourth quarter. Having said so, I want to come to key achievements and I want to start with outcome number one. Outcome number one is insightful data. Let me start off by what we haven't uh, done well uh, uh, in this outcome one is the recall of the mortality and causes of death released due to an error in the data file. Chairperson, uh, uh, we should not panic when we see the word error in a data file. Uh, what happens is this is in line with international uh, uh, best practice. When we are capturing data, when we move to further capturing and we see inconsistencies, we recall our products and we do issue a statement alerting the public that we have recalled uh, the, 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 the report based on the following. Sometimes it's when our users do raise an issue. There are times when users will raise an issue and only to find that it's a matter of interpretation and we are able to assist them in interpretation but uh, uh, we do follow international best practice and the uh, insolvency data was not published due to the challenges at the Department of Justice. We all know that the Department of Justice has been hit by a uh, massive uh, 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 issues of uh, 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 being hacked and that has actually made them not to supply us with insolvency data. We did experience this previously with the Department of Mining as well, which we reported with yourselves here in Parliament uh, when we came to mining data. But we were lucky that uh, we were able to recover the data uh, when the Department of uh, Minerals and Energy came back. They were able to recover the data before we even released the GDP. So our GDP was not affected on the side of mining at the time. But let me mention that insolvency data, Department of Justice had uh, challenges. We were not able to report on some indicators timely due to COVID-19, although some of them indeed came out. The mortality data, poverty and inequality, GHS, uh, General Household 2020 report, which was delayed, the annual labor markets uh, report. This was largely due to COVID-19. However, we were able to do the following. We released the rebased and benchmarked estimate, estimates of GDP. We published the financial census of municipalities time series from 2006 for the first time and compiled the natural uh, capital accounting country strategy in collaboration with key partners in the data ecosystem. We released a, a first ever accounts for protected areas and published COVID-19 vulnerable index and conducted pilot census and PS tests and, at national and, and, and continued with national debriefing. And of course, uh, CPI reweighting is on track and to be released in the uh, fourth quarter. Going forward is uh, outcome number two, agile operate, operating model. 
we piloted a, a, a code for practice for the quality management system. We commenced with the establishment of an end-to-end -end geospatial platform. Uh, we uh, went on with uh, uh, the value chain, innovations on the value chain, statistical value chain. We adopted the United Nations Generic Statistical Business Process Model, uh, version 5.1, and of course, the business process mapping for the CPI as is into the uh, to be uh, looking at the digital data collection. The business process mapping for the mixed mode data collection, uh, looking as is into the to be for the household surveys. This is very critical, uh, Chairperson and uh, honorable members, in that we have to hold on steadily to make sure that we don't cause disruptions in terms of the time series of the data we have produced over time. While on the other hand, we look at other new avenues, especially with disruptions caused by COVID-19, we need to be able to uh, make sure that uh, in terms of collections, we can collect even remotely without disrupting time series. Uh, modernization of the business processes, that is the pilot of the CPI digital data collection from outlets, as well as the pilot of the continuous population survey. Chairperson, we will look at uh, outcome number three, interconnected statistical systems. Legislative reform in the final stages, and indeed uh, uh, it has to be taken through cabinet, and uh, after that, the necessary legislative processes will follow. Uh, international engagements and participation uh, continue to be in ongoing. Uh, largely, most of them are done online, Chairperson. As we are talking now, we are attending the United Nations Statistical Commission. One of our colleagues, uh, Ms. Ntabiseng Mahata, is representing us there. She is uh, attending online as uh, there is a hybrid. Uh, we have even started meeting in person. We developed a South African statistical quality assessment framework, self-assessment online platform. And indeed the new strategic partnerships in the making uh, with other institutions, uh, including the Department of, of Home Affairs. We have engaged with the information regulator, particularly in the run-up to the uh, 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 census. And the information regulator has uh, confirmed that since time immemorial, uh, Status say has upheld uh, the prescripts of the popia. And uh, in their statement, they go and say, Status say is in full compliance with the conditions for the lawful processing of personal information in terms of section 37 of the POPIA. We will remember that previously we had reported on this issue of the POPIA chair. And having reported, uh, we indicated uh, that uh, we were in consultation with the information regulator. Transformed capabilities, uh, we uh, are looking at enterprise architecture, that is business and data architecture e-leave system, as well as electronic signature system, enhanced COVID-19 screening uh, uh, data reports, which uh, uh, during the three waves that we have gone through nationally, and the fourth wave that was almost taking off nationally, we have uh, uh, gone on both at our head office and our uh, uh, provincial offices to track developments that are occurring nationally and in our offices and followed all prescripts in such a way that we could not have our operations disrupted even at the highest levels of infections and unfortunately even at highest levels of deaths that were recorded, recorded in our country. Census and PS systems development were of course <clears throat> disrupted from time to time by COVID-19 because some of them had to be tested on the ground 
and uh, the prescripts that we had as uh, issued by the president uh, restricted a lot of movement in the country and at, at some stage movement was not possible at all uh, let us look at structure and people placement of staff below sms has been finalized and uh, of course uh, the, there were a bit of delays largely uh, due to engagement with unions we commenced with the filling of sms and critical positions and of course recruitment drive for census 2022 had uh, uh, its own challenges, especially in remote areas, in that most of our field workers uh, could not go to our offices as usual. One is that they, as members of the public, were afraid to go out to look for employment, as our QLFS has indicated from time to time, that members of the public were afraid to go out uh, to look for employment fearing for infections but also we had to regulate the issue of who accesses our offices so we had the processes of online applications uh, where uh, generally in the cities as well as in the uh, 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 locations what is that uh, 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 neighborhoods townships it, it is easier to go online but in rural areas it has become a bit of a challenge, but we circumvented that by looking at targeted recruitment. Now, resource alignment and planning, a comprehensive reprioritization process uh, continues to be in place. As we get money from National Treasury, we continue to reprioritize because uh, National Treasury cannot fund all the 600 positions, 592 positions that we don't have in the organization. But they are there, they are approved in our structure that has been approved by a, a government. Now, looking at the census, Chairperson, we have a, a brought this timetable because of interest. Most of uh, the census we will be reporting when we come back with the fourth quarter. So this is an out of scope reporting but we are bringing it because we know we are out in the field now and there is indeed national interest on this one. And we thought we should share with uh, uh, yourselves uh, as the portfolio committee, what are the issues. Let me mention that uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, interests. Uh, we have been accused chairperson of the green color we are choosing in the public space saying that we are panting for a particular political party. Let me mention that, uh, um, and I think it was mentioned as Ahang SA. And we said, even before Ahang SA was formed, we were testing uh, with uh, 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 was that focus groups nationally as of 2018. And uh, indeed the color that won the, the day uh, is the green color uh, and having come out as the green color. So accusations of a political nature, we have always maintained as let's say that we should not politicize the production of statistics. We have also seen it of political party, almost all political parties getting interested in our uh, recruitment almost coming to want to dictate to us, even chairperson, going as far as some political parties, including councillors particularly, at taking list of potential applicants in their neighborhood. And we have refused uh, to bow on that. And we have said, no, we cannot politicize a statistical process. And in this regard, we have gone on to maintain our independence in terms of the census uh, timelines as of the 2nd of february we went on the census night and we kicked off with uh, online self enumeration that is kawi as of the 3rd to the 25th of february i must admit chairperson that this online uh, uh, registration didn't take off as much 
we are actually lucky chairperson in that we do not have the fourth wave hitting through our country. Uh, we had gone on television, uh, television uh, different television stations, radios, community radios, to publicize online registration. Even in the cities, in the suburbs, as well as townships where it is easier to connect, uh, uh, we didn't have as much uh, 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 registrations as we would have expected. Let me mention that out of about 70 million households, Chairperson, 17.4 to, uh, to be exact, only about 455,000 had registered. And in this regard, Chairperson, it shows us, and this is a matter that we had repeatedly raised with this committee, that not everyone who can read and write and everyone who has a smartphone or can use it has an appetite to register online in other than uh, uh, using their phone to receive messages and to dial. Now, in this regard, Chairperson, when uh, this was not taking off in terms of uh, uh, self-enumeration, uh, our field work kicked off as of the uh, 14th of February, our copy that is a uh, computer assisted personal interviews where our field workers arrive with smart tablets and ask members of the public to be captured uh, as kicked off. And as it's ongoing, even people who have registered, who haven't returned their forms, our field workers do knock at their doors and if they cannot make available a sticker that they have been enumerated, they actually have to be enumerated in person. Uh, they, uh, or let me not use a, a technical jargon, uh, enumerated. They have to be counted in person. We have, as of the 28th of February, just prior to that, when we looked at our production, we announced that we would um, move our date of final collection to the 20th of March rather than the 28th of February. And we will have mop up going on until the 25th of March. This is in line with uh, international best practice. We know that uh, beyond, even before the COVID, in previous censuses, when there was not enough uh, collections, from an operational point of view, we have had to move dates for purposes of more collections not even on this uh, census of uh, population, but even in other censuses that we conduct, but even other nations. Canada goes for up to three months, Chairperson, uh, in data collection. Uh, our ambition of collecting in one month up to the 28th is more on the point of a reference period because we want as much possible that people must remember who was there as of the census night, 2nd of February. That is why we are not extending very far into April or May, allowing ourselves three months uh, like other nations. Ghana has had to uh, postpone their uh, end of date uh, three times. But COVID-19 has actually thrown nations off balance in terms of adhering to dates of collections, and we are no exception. The post-enumeration survey will kick off as of the 26th of March. The post-enumeration survey, Chairperson, is a sample of the entire undertaking of the census. We take 1% and we go back to a, a, a compare record for record to be able to know how many people we have missed, which is an undercount, or how many people we have uh, counted more than once, which is an overcount and we use the undercount or the overcount to estimate as a way of uh, uh, coming up with an estimate of what the national population is. We are one of the few countries in the world that performs a post-enumeration survey and we make our undercount known to the public and to the world so that uh, it is known by how much we are making estimations in terms of adjustments to our population, 
but also for the population to know. Before we go to the next slide, let me mention, but may, maybe let me talk to it as we go to the next slide. Because in the next slide, then we are talking specifically to registration for remote data collection closed on the 25th of February. And then uptake was not as much as we had uh, hoped. Uh, uh, and, and we had to reopen it up to the 5th of February. Uh, and we even reopened it again. This is online collections. Uh, when we realized we were getting lesser numbers. In one case, when we reopened for a week, hoping that we would get millions registering, we only got 130,000. Uh, only 25% of households who registered for the computer assisted web interviews have completed their questionnaires. So even when people register, they don't actually fill the questionnaires. That is why we have to go and count them in person. That is why households ha have had until the 25th of February. Of course, by the time we send this, uh, 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 we were saying they have until the 25th of February. The in-person interviews, which we call computer-assisted personal interviews, uh, 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 show a, a much a better rate of completion, which is our main mode of collection. When we send this, we were saying over 40 million, I mean, uh, 2 million uh, questionnaires had been completed by the time we sent this. But let me mention that uh, by now we monitor this on daily basis. Actually, daily basis is even far less. We monitor this minute to minute, hour to hour. We know uh, at any given moment where we, uh, we are not doing well, because this is critical to have a final uh, uh, population count. So by the time we sent in, we were saying we had 2 million uh, KP questionnaires. These are in-person questionnaires completed. As of now, we have uh, more than 4 million uh, completed. And of course, uh, data uh, collection has been extended to the 20th of March, as I've already indicated. Computer-assisted telephone interviews will run until the 20th of March. Chairperson, what are the strategic risks? Uh, the strategic risks are demand for statistics outweigh the supply of, st of official statistics. What is it that we are doing to mitigate? Uh, we are putting uh, the census will offer us, census 2022, will offer us a baseline for statistical information system in South Africa, which we will, from a side of our operations, we will use for our sample surveys. But from a planning point of view, it will be a big benefit to members of the public. And this is what we are saying uh, again and again to members of the public, especially those who are refusing to be enumerated, that uh, uh, they need to know that this information is not for status sake. One, it is for themselves to use, whether they want to venture into business or do anything in terms of the decisions they make on daily lives. But it's also critical for them to hold those that they uh, uh, elect into office accountable in terms of the services they have or they do not have. But furthermore, uh, the census is a full count of everyone who finds themselves within the borders of South Africa. So there are people, especially illegal immigrants, who uh, um, are shying away from being enumerated. And Chairperson, I spend all, almost every day of my life in the field. Yesterday, I was in the field in the morning, in the evening. I'm still going to field outside this presentation to encourage everyone. And the leadership of StatsSA is also equally in the field. Now, in terms of the supply, we are saying that discontinued and re reduced, discontinued reports and, and, and reduced surveys have an effect. But the mitigation is that the benefit that we will have, especially in the financial year 2022, 2023, in terms of received baseline funding for the income and expenditure survey will help us to deal with poverty and inequality. Obviously, the report won't come out now because this is a baseline funding and it takes us two years to conduct this survey. 
So we will run it this the next financial year as of the 1st of April, all the way into the uh, financial year thereafter. And we are also looking at various thematic reports and also research on alternative data sources, which uh, uh, we are looking at non-traditional way of data collection, which we have been investigating even before COVID. But COVID places more a pressure to have to move even faster. And we need faster change, Chairperson. Uh, now, let us look at business operating model. Uh, it continues to be disrupted, especially at household level, the surveys level. Now, uh, firstly, is that generally, gated communities have been posing a risk in our household surveys that access has always been very difficult. COVID-19 has made it even a lot more difficult at household level. So uh, how we mitigate this, we want to modernize the statistical value chain and use alternative data sources to uh, mitigate and make sure that we are able to report at all times. Resources, high vacancy rate continues to uh, give us a challenge. We have received additional funding in the ENE for compensation of employees as of the next financial year. And we will continue in the form of mitigation. We will reprioritize in relation to the filling of critical posts. The challenge here is that we can't fill all positions, Chairperson. Our biggest challenge is at operations level. If we don't deal with this, we will affect the issue of basic statistics because we'll have nobody to do the work. We have challenges, of course, at the leadership level, SMS level, but if we don't have people who must do the work, we will have a serious challenge. So we'll, cont we'll continue to reprioritize. We will reskill uh, for the new environment. Chairperson, when we look at the next slide, which then takes us to the five-year strategic plan priorities, which started in 2020-21 and will conclude in 2024-25. We are saying that we will continue to drive legislative reform. It has remained our strategic imperative. We will sustain and protect the quality of national indicators. This is a point that I was talking to Chairperson, that in everything that we do, our focus in prioritizing and reprioritizing as and when we get some money from National Treasury, even with a high vacancy rate at operations level is to make sure that we protect the quality of national indicators. Because these are not our indicators as let's say Jefferson, but these are the indicators that the public needs. These are indicators that uh, people in business need. These are indicators that our main user government needs. Certainly, we say that we will drive transformation and change, largely uh, looking at our value chain, our statistical value chain, but also issues in relation to our staff members. Chairperson, the next slide says in the Kuala, which I have spoken so much on, which I would not want to speak much today, except that in Sipedi, I would say, as in Sisutu in Situana, and in English and in, in Shivenda, I would say that and in English and Africans, I would say finish and clap. And the next slide, Chairperson, it looks like it's blank. I thank you. Uh, thank you, SG. Honorable members, this um, meeting was scheduled to end at one o'clock, and we still have one presentation outstanding, the presentation by Brand SA. I suggest that we take the Brand SA, and thereafter, members will be allowed to ask questions on both um presentations together and then answers 
be provided in writing through the office of the secretary of the uh, of the committee that's that's the proposal i'm putting concretely to you uh, honorable members also taking into account that we have also the house sitting today agreed chair support the chair agreed chair Supported, supported. I don't have anyone who says no. Thank you very much. Can I now invite uh, Brand SA? Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson, uh, Honorable Deputy Ministers, uh, Honorable Members and Colleagues. Good, good afternoon. Chair, before I make any comment, but at, at most times, Brand South Africa, it's always put last and we always gallop through our presentations, and sometimes we don't have an effective engagement with members. I'm pleading with the chair sometimes to really uh, consider us, uh, maybe we are a small organization, therefore the chair feels we always should be the last one, but we always gallop, I'll, I'll try my best. Chair, I'm honored to lead the brand. Can I say this, can I say this, Tan? We, yes. there, there, there is no entity that is small before us. But uh, I have taken note of what you are raising. Maybe we will uh, see how do we uh, juggle around these uh, presentations next time with the uh, committee secretary. But I have taken note of your of your of your uh, gripe. Thank you. We will Thank address that. Thanks very much. Uh, Chair, as I have said, we are honored to lead the Brand South Africa team as we table quarterly reports unto your good selves today. And I can upfront assure the portfolio committee members that Brand South Africa continues to work hard to implement the vision of the National Development Plan and has aligned our annual plans to the State of the Nation address as outlined by His Excellency President Ramaphosa. We are also pleased by the announcement by the pre President in the current State of the Nation address uh, on 100 days to finalize a comprehensive social compact to grow our economy and create jobs and combat hunger. We'll therefore adhere to our tasks to develop communication strategies to elevate this call because our mandate is derived from these key strategic objectives outlined by the president. These three quarterly reports are in fact a portfolio of evidence, and I repeat, it's a portfolio of evidence of the role Brand South Africa has played in positioning South Africa to realize economic reconstruction and the recovery plan, luring investors both locally, regionally, and internationally, and having taken account the role COVID-19 has played, Brand South Africa has used different communication platforms to promote South Africa. And in particular, we were using the digital platform to ensure that there's also an impact. But we have also uh, 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 took into account the issues of corruption, GBV, and we have speak, spoken to and explained to investors what we, we are doing and our programs, given the challenges of budgetary constraints, that's what we are doing currently. Chair, given the role of others to retort to negative uh, messaging and lack of appreciation of the role that our country continues to play, ours is to rebuild trust, market our country and build social cohesion. We'll also be looking forward to the outcomes of the investment conference taking place on the 24th of this month uh, to rebuild our economy because this is what we do best. We'll be able to go up there and be able to explain what government will do. And one of the most important things is for us to have a chance to have physical engagement, hence the expo, hence uh, 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 other programs that will be explained by the, the acting CEO. We have also addressed concerns raised by members in the previous engagement on the issues of internal controls. And as uh, the AG stated in his report, we have answered questions that is related to what Honorable Mugweba and um, um, Honorable Kibi has raised previously. So if you look at what they raised about inconsistencies of reporting, it is being addressed. The issues of supply chain remains a challenge. We are going we are to deal with it and we'll explain it. And you will see how we've digitized our records as part of the plan, uh, the action plan to address your concerns. 
we are now submitting quarterly reviews uh, as part of the response and we are audited internally in terms of our performance. Uh, Chair, the recent announcement by the Minister of Finance to allocate 17.5 billion over the MTF period for catalytic projects will translate in job creation. And this is a message we are going to carry with pride to the nation and the world over. And the 76 billion allocated specifically for job creation is our low hanging fruit to prove that we are a, a country at work. And we are going to also popularize that message, including the fact that the president came with an initiative to create jobs which got an allocation of 18 billion, 18.4 billion. So we'll engage stakeholders with buoyance this time around since the announcement made in both SONA and the budget speech respectively. And I hope every South African will also buy into this message and understand it's not the role only of Brand South Africa to carry this positive narrative, but all of us. And having said this, Chair, please allow me, because we don't have time, to allow the acting CEO to present a portfolio of evidence of what we have done through the, these three quarters led by our active CEO, Mrs. Tembele Ntombele. And I need to also say, in, 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 the, in, in, to, in our team, we also have the chair of HRSEC, Mr. Uh, Mlungisi Johnson, who has accompanied us to answer all other questions. I thank you for your indulgence. Chair, please allow the team to make a quick presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Tandi. Uh, who comes first, Tandi? Uh, 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 Chair of HR said, do you want to make comments before Tembile present? Chair, I think it, in the interest of time, uh, you've done the introduction. Uh, should there be any area that requires the emphasis or addition, uh, one shall come at that point. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Please briefly so that you can do the show and tell um, thank, thank you, Brenda Say Chair, and um, good afternoon, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members. I will try and uh, rush through the presentation. So without further ado, um, I'll start by providing context to our mandate, and this is quite important um, given the space that we play in and, and, and the ability of people to then understand where exactly um, do we deliver on our mandate. Our mandate, simply put, as Petra trusted, is to manage South Africa's nation brand reputation in order to improve its global competitiveness as well as attractiveness. 20 years later, honorable members, as we celebrate 20 years of existence of Brand South Africa, we still carry on this flag um, pride and flying it high in ensuring that we create a nation brand that inspires its people and is admired globally, which is what is encapsulated in our vision. And then with our mission, what we want to do is we want to be the authority on the nation brand issues. Um, then I'll move to slide number three, which really encapsulates the primary purpose of Brand South Africa. And I would like to direct the honorable members to the second paragraph on my left that says Brand South Africa aims to indirectly, and the doing word indirectly, contribute towards the economic growth, job creation, poverty alleviation, and social cohesion, um, thereby encouraging local foreign investment, tourism, and trade through the promotion of South Africa. And the reason there is it's indirect, it's purely because we want to deal with those questions that says, Brand South Africa, how many jobs have you created? Ours is to make South Africa attractive and competitiveness by channeling those messages that will attract inward investment. That is where we play. And on the right-hand side, briefly, we are about building confidence in South Africa. We're about um, shaping and influencing perceptions around South Africa, enhancing the stature of our brand in the continent as well as abroad. We are also about analyzing and being the champion of research so that we are able to empower our stakeholders so that they can rally behind the brand and carry the brand with pride. And they can talk about South Africa from a place of informed, of being informed. Domestically, we also aim to inspire pride, patriotism, whilst we promote social cohesion, which is what um, is also part of the outcome 14 where brands South Africa Brand South Africa also participate in. Our communications program seeks to do 
three things is to champion the thought leadership space and to counter negative messages and to champion the reputation program. And lastly, looking at the global strategic events where we try and collaborate with our stakeholders to promote South Africa. At the foundation of our five-year strategy plan, as well as APP, it is very important that the honorable members understand that we have aligned ourselves with the NDP, which is our strategic um, footprint or blueprint for the nation. And we also um, have encapsulated the, the SONA priorities um, within our, our strategic plan and APP towards um, achieving the two impact statements that are also captured in our APPs, one being creating a prosperous nation brand, and the second one being creating a patriotic and a socially cohesive nation brand. The next slides will speak to understanding the state of the nation, which is quite imperative. However, given the time challenges, I would like to only focus on a few slides, slide seven being the first one. Reputation is important. Our mandate is stating that we must be promoting South and, and managing um, brand South Africa's um, reputation. So which means we must always have reputation drivers at our pulse. And what does that mean? It means being able to then promote this country, tapping onto those reputation drivers as they appear on screen, being able to talk about our economy and our strength and our weaknesses, to talk about the governance and how important it is, you know, to look at good governance and the indices that are tapping into that pillar. The ability to position this country as a desired investment and export destination. So at the end of the day, why this strategy, this reputation uh, slide is important. It's all about showcasing the world that they can trust the brand South Africa. They can trust and plow their money into our country because when they plow their money into our country, it makes us able to realize the impact statements that we have in our APP of that of creating a prosperous nation brand. Because why would we not be able to create a prosperous nation brand when we are able to attract inward investment, when we are able to have South Africa as a recommended destination for people to come and visit and pay their money to actually start businesses, to respect our brand, to actually you know make South Africa successful and even admire South Africa. So for us as brands South Africa, this is the space that nobody else plays in, but we try and we spear champion this area of reputation and bring along our stakeholders that are also uh, playing in some of these sectors that we aim to promote. The next slide that I'd like to focus on is slide number nine, because we are using the indices where we perform well to tell the good story of South Africa. And this is just a brief synopsis that we as Brand South Africa, we then look at the brand enablers as informed by our research and say, how do we use this brand enablers to tell the good story? That is just not good, but compelling enough to actually make somebody rethink South Africa and rethink about you know, visiting South Africa. So which is when you look at the equity model, we are talking about converting people that are away to actually try us and by trying, I mean, coming to visit and then later on coming to, to invest and subsequently until they become loyalists of our country and we tap into indices such as soft power, the good country index, where we are rated well to then tell the beautiful story of South Africa. The next slide is the inward slide, um, slide number 11, because it's important to also say whatever you push outside as you build a South Africa and you make it beautiful and attractive, you also must fix things at home. And we fix things at home by focusing on three critical indices, the national brand pride, what we call a brand pride index, an active citizenship index and the social cohesion index. The two indexes, which is the pride and social cohesion, we've seen short-term gains there, which really, if you look at what the drivers were, um, where on the pride, it's the democratic principles of the country towards a greater collaboration, um, unity, and then the other one is the ability to innovate and care for one another. And under social cohesion, the driver there was really around the community spirit brought about 
through us working together in beating COVID-19 as well as its challenges. So whilst this provides an outlook of Brain South Africa's activities, so there's three critical indices for the country, but the question is then, Brain South Africa, how do you measure your contribution towards these three? The answer is simple. We, we came and we formed a project or a program rather, I call it a call to action movement, which is called Play Your Part. Back in the days, 2011, this year, it's 10 year anniversary of Play Your Part and it has grown phenomenally well. If you look at the numbers, because if I just, the three year comparison period, 36% to 44%, coming from a 9% um, back in the days of 2012. So that tells us that we can actually be accountable for our activities because we are able to measure what we put out there. We also contribute in the constitutional awareness as Brand South Africa um, in outcome 14, where we report on our activities and our interventions and contribution in amplifying the understanding of South African constitution whilst pushing the, the, you know, the responsibilities that it comes with. And again, it gives me pleasure that we have also grown with this campaign because we show it and we test it with our people. Have you seen this? Do you understand the message? And they tell us and they play back to us. So we tells us that we are doing something right. The next slide that I'd like to actually focus on is slide number 13, because it gives an understanding of challenges and the issues that we were faced with as a country. And if the country suffers, Brent South Africa suffers 10 times more, because we must try and redeem South Africa in the, in the faces of the international community. So these, as um, we look at the period under review, which is Q1 to Q3, these are the issues that we were dealing with, the energy crisis, the COVID-19, continued unemployment, um, especially among youth, the local government election, GBV, which continues to harm very badly the reputation of South Africa in the international communities and even domestically as well. We also were faced with um, July unrest, which challenged us as an organization um, and really required speed in terms of us responding and, and, and reassuring the international investors that their investment is secured in South Africa. And the continued rising you know, crime incidents in South Africa, as well as obviously the travel ban as a result of COVID-19. Some, um, they call it uh, the red list where we continuously were um, put on that list, but none, be that as it may, there were interventions that we um, put into market as, as Brand South Africa to really deal hands on um, and then head on with these challenges. The next slide that I would go to is the slide of interventions. Because the other slides really, as I said, they focus on um, the tone. So the tone during the period, and it really is giving a high level in terms of what drove the, the red tone, which is really the negative tone and the green tone, which is the held one um, on brand. So we had to come up with the strategy quickly in Q2 straight after the, the unrest. And we are also bearing in mind that we must respond because most countries more than ever right now, they need entities like Brand South Africa because they were only known for one pillar, especially those that were reliant on tourism. So the question is what else then, you know, do they promote, how else do they promote themselves? But likely, I would say likely for us because we are still in a better position. We have other dimensions and other sectors that we can promote um, other than, than tourism because we have a diverse economy. So we had to come up with a, with a strategy that seeks to achieve, you know, rebuilding trust, as you saw in that reputation index, that trust is important and confident in South Africa. We had to leverage on our history of overcoming the odds. So tapping on our inner strength, the resilient, to say we can deal with this thing. That is why we saw people saying protect SA during the time when we're being compromised. And then lastly, the strategy had to also reassure South Africans as well as investors and tourists that South Africa's ability to rebuild and restore trust is possible because South Africa is a nation of possibilities as well as opportunities. So simply put our strategy in the next slide then said, we as Brand South Africa started invi inviting people to believe in South Africa, both at home and abroad. 
and rebuilding confidence in South Africa as a preferred destination for growth and investment. And if we look at the world standards in terms of all the other country brands, they always focus on these six pillars when they check and assess the performance of countries. So it is imperative that as we believe in SA, we provide reasons to believe that are strong. Why must we come and invest in South Africa or travel you know, and visit South Africa? We also have to push the number of exports that we do and, and, and in, invite people to come and export more from us. The governance story, talking about our judiciary, talking about our worldly admired constitution. We talk about our people who are continuing to fly the flag in various fields, as well as then culture um, and heritage, which is actually very rich. And we react we are retelling the South African story with a fresh voice to inspire confidence, to inspire investors to really look at us with fresh new eyes. And everything that we package to these audiences, we always tell the same story that you used to you, you used to know a South Africa that was alive with possibility. Now we are a country that is making it happen, a country that inspires new and different ways. So how did we take then this strategy? Linking it back to our APPs, you would know and you would see that from an outcome perspective, there's one outcome that speaks to increased attractiveness, thereby competitiveness of the nation brand. So what does it mean from a game plan, from an action and indicators? It simply means we have to come up with the marketing campaigns that illustrate attractiveness of the nation brand. And these campaigns are quite important because they keep South Africa at the top of mind of potential investors as well as um, visitors. These campaigns are important because they increase our share of voice and share of visibility. They also help us build associations so that when we ask people what comes to mind when you think of South Africa, it goes beyond mining, but it can start to talk about people. It can start to talk about our ability to turn things around in the science and technology space, for instance. And then all of this, we do them to influence perception because we know that if you are in a game of reputation, it's, it's all about you influencing how you are being seen by the world as well as South Africans. So that's where your reputation management strategy come in play, including the communication. So that once we fix this and somebody says, so how does it look like when it's fixed? We are getting and we will achieve a prosperous nation brand leading to the outcome number two, that is largely speaking to South Africans and it's challenging them because we want to increase brand, um, increase nation brand advocacy and active citizenship. I briefly spoke about play your part, which is a proposition that we've put in out there and South Africans love it. I know they love it because the numbers are telling us that they are away. And when they are away, they want to be part and parcel of our journey as we are promoting South Africa. And that is why in its 10 year anniversary, this year we've hosted our awards of play part where we are celebrating active citizenship in various um, or multi-dimensional pillars that are inscripted within the national development plan. We also have the play your part ambassador program where we are asking and encouraging South Africans that are frequenters to other countries to actually leave the brand and, and we equip them and empower them with messages so that they can contribute towards a positive social change, not only in South Africa, but even abroad. Similarly with global South Africans, talking to South Africans based in other countries, especially now in the time when we are participating, for instance, at the Expo 2020 in Dubai, we are relying on the crowd of South Africans that are based there to then come on board and amplify the South African messages. Because once we do that, at the end of the day, we are achieving what we would like to see after five years, a socially cohesive nation brand, people that are patriotic and are proud to call themselves South African. And in slide number 22, which then speaks to the another outcome, um, attractiveness of uh, competitiveness of the nation brand, as well as alignment of stakeholders to the nation brand experience. Obviously, um, honorable members, we can't just, you know, as Chair said earlier on, it's not a brand as a, um, what we would call mandate, but it's also a mandate of everybody who is proud to call themselves South African to make sure that they collaborate with us. So these activities under this banner of aligning stakeholders to the nation brand experience speaks to our collaborative efforts with the public sector, private stakeholders, the civil societies, which is quite important because then we get more voices other than just the employees of Brand South Africa. 
We also created a brilliant program, which we call the masterclass, where we train stakeholders, including foreign missions, on how to live the brand, on what South Africa, who South Africa is, you know, the drivers of reputation, and how to brand South Africa in their relevant spheres. We are building and growing more soldiers on the ground, or rather good brand ambassadors to rally behind brand South Africa. And if we do that again, we will attract because we will all be speaking in a cohesive manner and a coherent manner. People will say, who are these people coming from? Or where, who are these people and where they are coming from? And we will tell them we are coming in the land of, of South Africa, a land of possibilities. So I will then, uh, through you, um, Honorable Chair, I do have my two colleagues. One will speak on the performance of the organization as per target and the other briefly sum up the audit and financials. And then we will wrap up with the highlights of the quarter that really brought our mandates to life. So Luandila, you can go through. Thank you, CEO. Thank you, Chair. Um, I will be taking the committee through, I think, in the interest of time. We'll just um, look at the targets, the three quarterly targets that we have achieved and the ones that we have not achieved, Brand South Africa. So for quarter one, as you can see, we've achieved 81% um, and 19% was not achieved. And that is 25 um, targets out of the 31 that we've had. And in quarter two, we achieved um, 89 and 11 was not achieved that is 29 of the targets was achieved out of the 32 that we had and in the last quarter which is quarter three we achieved um, um 87 percent and 13 was not achieved and that is 28 targets out of the 32 targets that we've had just um going down to the actual targets that were not achieved um i will speak to uh, the rate as i've mentioned you can uh, as you can see we, in terms of the 30 day payment of the invoices in quarter two and quarter one, we have actually achieved only in quarter three where we achieved 86, 83%. And this is as a result of the invoice that is currently queried by management and, and management is actually in consultation with the service provider in this regard. And um, the second one is the vacancy rates. The 10% vacancy rate is, um, as uh, you note, uh, Brand South Africa was placed on moratorium on the filling of positions as a result of a, a proposed measure with Tourism South Africa. However, we have subsequently received a partial upliftment to fill our positions for a period of 24 months um, in October. And we have embarked on a process of filling these positions. And we have um, uh, in the process of, uh, we've identified uh, about seven positions, which is the director of corporate services. We are currently um, interviewing for that position now. And we are hoping that by, um, uh, by April or latest May, the position is filled. Finance officer, the position, the offer has been made to the CFO. Um, and uh, in terms of the researcher, we have appointed and the organization uh, was able to appoint an Indian male with a disability and now has a representation of about 2% um, disability within the organization. Um, in terms of um, supply chain manager, we are at a verification stage. It was advertised. Uh, employee uh, candidates were interviewed. We are now in the process of um, approvals and, and, and actually um, finalizing, hoping to uh, have a, uh, appointed by the 1st of April. Uh, GM Global Markets manage, uh, and the researcher, it's currently internal. We're hoping to advertise those two positions now in March. And in terms of the manager office of the CEO, advert closed on the 25th of February. So we're currently in the process of um, scheduling the shortlisting. But um, in terms of our positions, all of them, uh, by May, we are hoping that um, they would be filled. And if we, if there are no um, uh, resignations and no, um, uh, in terms of terminations and movement, we um, we would be around 12.2% by May um, in terms of the filling of our positions. Um, and if you look at the target, um, of the 92% overall uh, performance uh, for the organization. That one is automatically affected immediately if there's a target that is not achieved um, um, within that particular quarter. So, um, so I'll speak to it and then it automatically speaks to the few targets that I will be touching based on in terms of program two and three. Um, so the reason for us, uh, for the three quarters that we have not really achieved um, uh, for, for, for the 92% 90, the 
um, in quarter one, two, and three. Um, it's as a result of a, a, a moratorium, as I've mentioned, with the with the ten percent vacancy rate, and also um, I've also mentioned the invoices that have not yet been um, finalized with uh, with the service provider, and then we've also had engagements that were postponed um, by service providers um, in this regard, and and therefore we have actually put plans in place um, to ensure that the targets that we're not achieving in Q3 are conducted in order so that the organization can meet the annual um, target in this regard. Um, I would then go straight to slide 13, which speaks to, as I've mentioned uh, briefly, that uh, the target that I was speaking to actually speaks to the ones that are following. So if you look at the number of integrated um, reputation communication activities implemented for strategic platforms, uh, the WERF meeting was postponed um, uh, uh, due to uh, the pandemic and the Invest um, Africa debate was moved to quarter two and then it was concluded um, at that time. Moving um, to slide 31, um, there were a target in terms of the South African Global Reputation Study uh, report produced. Um, that's where the organization had budget constraints and um, but the funds in terms of procuring the tool, but the funds have actually been um, uh, redirected in order to make sure that um, we achieve that target. Uh, moving on to the last one, which is slide 40, um, the target that was not achieved in terms of the number of uh, trainings um, uh, impact survey that are uh, conducted. Uh, in Q1, that target was not um, achieved. As I've mentioned, again, the focus group discussion were moved to quarter two, but subsequently um, have been um, achieved. Thank you. I will now hand over to my colleague, Mr. Zolilezi. Um, thank you. Thank you, and cutting honorable members. I'll also not waste any time and take you briefly through to our um, financial um, performance. Um, our budget is uh, split into these three programs, the brand marketing, the stakeholder relations, um, as well as the administration. So on the uh, brand marketing, the budget um, uh, for the first, second, and third quarter was 64.4 million. We actually spent um, 51.3 million with uh, an under, uh, underspending of 13.1 million, which represents a 20% um, variance. And the reason we are saying for, for the underspending <clears throat> was largely due to these um, uh, programs, our projects that were, that were held at the latter part of the quarter and then the invoices and or the billings were only received in January and February relating to the third quarter. So, the, those invoices would then have um, um, formed part of the 51 million expenditure. Um, and as a result now, uh, as it, as it um, this quarter, that is um, that, that picture has drastically changed because we have actually spent um, on, on that program. Um, the rest of the um, uh, under ex expenditure was in relation to the postponement, as one has mentioned, of the uh, international perception study in that program, as well as the nation brand index. Uh, moving on to the stakeholder um, relations, we uh, had budgeted to spend 15.9 million. We then uh, spent 10.2 million with a variance of 36%, which is 5.6 million uh, in monetary terms. And uh, the reason for that also was the investment conference um, that was postponed to the fourth quarter, uh, as well as the WEF divorce, which has been moved to the next financial period. Uh, lastly, on the administration, we had spent, uh, we had budgeted to spend 79.6 million. We then um, spent 68.7 with a variance of 14%, which is 10.8 million. We are also saying that the reason was because of the um, underspending on the employee cost and um, as well as the, the delays in the procurement of, of capital assets. I just want to reiterate or emphasize the fact that these um, 
forensics do not represent savings in the organization because the organization is dealing with a shoestring budget. Therefore, the amounts have been redirected to the underfunded project, and as a result, um, we do not anticipate to, to make any savings, and um, there won't be any, any surpluses at, at the end of, of March, um, as I'm indicating, with, with our mega budget. So, in overall, we are saying um, for the third quarter, we had budgeted a total of 160 million. We spent um, 130 with, with the variance of 29.6 uh, million. So that is a 19% variance overall. We can move on to the next slide. Uh, on this slide, we're just going to give a summary of the audit findings relating to the previous financial year, the 2020-21 financial year, as well as the progress on the audit action plans that we put in place. We have split our audit areas into three, the supply chain, the finance, and the performance information on the left. In the middle, the, the summer of the findings were in relation to submission of information um, that was, was, was sometimes late. And we're saying also there was a misstatement, a misstatement that we picked up uh, in the financial statements. And uh, there was misalignments of annual uh, performance plans um, and annual performance reports on the, on, the, on the audit findings. And then we then put in place these audit action plans to digitalize the schedules and improve the document management system. And um, on the financial statements, we prepare them on a on, 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 on monthly basis. And uh, we have them audited by our internal auditors on, on a monthly basis. We also um, I took the same route with regards to the performance information because on a quarterly basis we review um, the, our performance results and have them audited by our internal auditors on our on my external right we then um, are giving the, the the progress that we've made so far to say that we now have a fully functioning internal audit we now prepare monthly financial statements that we um, submit to exco we, 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 we are tracking our audit detection plans and we, we believe that we are on track to, to have corrected everything by, by the year end. We have been recorded in the area to expenditure thus far um, in, the, in the current year and all our schedules and registers, we have now digitalized them and um, are kept in, in our systems. And lastly, we have a fully digitalized uh, financial system which enables all our workforce to be able to, um, to work from home, which has really assisted us in working effectively even um, during this pandemic. Uh, can move on to the next slide. Lastly, we're just giving a summary of the progress of our internal auditors. Um, in, the, in, in these areas, the supply chain management, quarterly financial statement, as well as the performance information. And um, the, the quarter three audit is still underway. The results that we've received are in relation to only quarter one and quarter two. They were satisfactory for supply chain as well as the financial statements and needed improvements on the um, quarterly performance information. And lastly, just uh, before I then um, give back to, to you, Chair, uh, it's just to indicate as well, uh, to avoid other questions from the members, is to say um, in terms of our overall budget, we, we split it at inception to ensure that 52% is allocated to our core business and then about 48% then goes to, um, uh, to, to all our administrative duties. So, um, so far, that is that is all I can say. And then lastly, um, with regards to the invoices um, not paid within 30 days, we, we have really engaged with, with suppliers because they were uh, basically billing us for services that were not rendered and um, they have agreed to issue credit notes and correction of those so that we can only pay for services that we have received and that were received satisfactory. Um, that will be all from the finance side. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, honorable members, and in ending, 
from slide 45 onwards, it really is a show and tell of how Brand South Africa has then implemented this new strategy to reposition South Africa you know, during the COVID and given the July unrest. Nation Brand Forum, a platform where we attracted world-class um, speakers from international communities and their are key opinion leaders um, and they are influential within the space of Nation Brand. So it was quite great because this platform provided three pillars it provided a platform for stakeholders to reflect on what is going right with South Africa and what is going wrong with South Africa and be able to then use that to rebuild um, and come up with ways of rebuilding messages and rebuilding strategies so that we reassure our investors as well as our, our visitors. So we are currently busy implementing the outcomes that we received from this collaboration of this nature. The next one that is also quite important is the UK collaborations which they amplify the economic reconstruct and recovery plan, as well as the investment drive. Those offices in UK and US are very strategic for us because whatever we do at home, they basically amplify it to the audiences. They also play a supportive role to South Africans that are now going to do business in UK and they have their uh, business, whether it's from government or it's civil society or um, it's just general citizens. So they play a crucial role, but the primary agenda is the one that is aligned with the executive authority of pushing investment drive. And then the play your part business edition. A question is we, we must walk the talk. We cannot say to South Africans, play your part and we are not doing it. So we as Brand South Africa have created an online portal where we train entrepreneurs in South Africa, even the ones that want to start businesses because we want to create a self-reliant society. So if they are trained for free, it's an online portal, it's entrepreneurs that are training um, general citizens and the uptake has been very great, especially now when everybody is struggling. So we are truly um, walking and talking the walk, um, walking the talk. And lastly, the expo, as I've said, we have used that platform to position South Africa as a desirable investment destination, working together, as I've said, with um, global South Africans, including Chamber of Business that is based in Dubai. And we utilize our strength in the creative arts pillar to showcase how we inspire new and different ways. So I would like to stop there. Thank you very much, honorable chair and honorable members. Thank you very much, uh, honorable members. I see honorable Kibi, honorable Gondwe. Take the platform, honorable Kibi, and then honorable Gondwe, you follow honorable Maglua. Uh, thank you, thank you, honorable chair. Uh, let me welcome and appreciate both uh, presentations by State SA and Brand South Africa. Honorable Chair, let me start with uh, Brand SA. One is quite happy to hear uh, that uh, yeah, they have people also living with disability in, uh, in, in the department. And also the, the partially uh, upliftment of the moratorium uh, because it really impacted very badly on their, on their spending. Honorable Chair, my question is which, uh, which collaborative activities with public sector is Brand South Africa doing regarding the nation brand? Are these activities yielding good results and what are these results? My next one is since COVID-19 restrictions have eased uh, around the world and the use of online activities has been uh, successfully employed, employed. Will, will the activity postponed uh, by, uh, by partners in the UK due to COVID-19 restrictions be revised and by when will they be revised? Honorable Chair on uh, Usted South Africa, given that 84 staff members left the department and the vacancy rate is at 18%, which is almost twice above the threshold. Is the department addressing this issue? If so, how far is the department in addressing it? My second one is that the department released the first uh, ever accounts for protected areas. What are protected areas and why are they so uh, classified? Honorable Chair, I also just uh, want to know from State South Africa, uh, what, uh, how are they preventing the uh, 
criminals from maybe uh, harassing the, the, their staff that is uh, moving around our communities uh, to make sure that they are safe, especially uh, with them carrying these gadgets. What is it that they are doing to make sure that uh, those gadgets are not taken from them? And also, what is it that they are experiencing in terms of criminals also uh, trying to, 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 pro, to, 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 to do whatever they are doing and uh, pretending to be the staff of a, a state South Africa? Thank you, Chairperson. Honorable Kondwe. Uh, Honorable James. Um, let me start also by appreciating the presentations from Stats Essay and Brand Essay. And I'm going to start with Stats Essay. Um, in slide 18, they indicated that 25% um, of the households that had registered for the um, um, you know, assisted interview um, had uh, you know, uh, managed to, to complete um, you know, the questionnaire in this regard. And um, they had, you know, then given them until the 25th of February to, to ensure that, you know, you know um, uh, questionnaires were, were, were completed. And now my question is, we are past the 25th of February. Has this number not improved? I know that Rea Maluika did touch on the fact that there's been a, a poor uptake in terms of people responding to, to um, you know, to, um, the survey, uh, survey 2022. So I wanted to know whether there hasn't been an improvement um, because the cutoff was um, the 25th of February and we are past the, the 25th of February um, uh, right now. And then regarding, um, now going back again to census 2022, um, th there's been reports around challenges um, encountered with the kickoff of, of census 2022. Um, you know, I read reports where, you know, um, uh, you know, they indicated the reports indicated that the you know stats essay was beleaguered with a number of logistical challenges, including recruitment issues, which he's touched up on um, and talked about the fact that um, they were now um, you know doing targeted recruitment. But I believe there were also issues around uh, tablets and 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 um, uh, vehicles that were responsible for delivering um, a, a number of things. And I want to find out. Um, um, what other ch challenges have they encountered uh, with Census 2022 and, and how they are going to um, counteract those challenges? Because um, it's very important that, um, you know, as challenges are identified, there are also interventions um, identified to counter those challenges. And then um, going to brand essay, um, I think uh, with previous interactions with brand essay, we've always maintain that we, the issue of the amalgamation has to be sorted out and, and there has to be, um, you know, a timeline in terms of when is it going to happen. Um, and I also, like Honorable Kiwi, welcome the fact that um, there's talk of, of, of the upliftment of the moratorium, uh, because we've always maintained that unless the amalgamation issue is sorted out and, and you know, the moratorium is done away with, um, stats, I mean, Brand SA will not be able to meet its targets. And this was evident from uh, the fact that uh, its vacancy rate target w w was not met. And, and as the presenter indicated, it was hampered by the fact that you, you had this moratorium and, and this talk of the amalgamation. And I think, Chairperson, we really need to get an update on this amalgamation with Tourism SA and, and where it's at at this point and when it's going to be concluded because there's just been talk and talk and talk, and I'm, and I'm afraid that it's hampering, um, you know, the performance of, of Brand AC. Thank you so much, Galibocha, Honorable James. Thank you. Uh, Honorable McClure. Thank you so much, Chairperson. I, I don't want to waste time, but uh, it's also unfortunate that we cannot uh, interrogate the uh, report of Brand Essay because listening to the presenters, I must admit and say that they are very enthusiastic and uh, they are very excited, but it does not uh, balance with what we see on paper here, especially, and, and I want to read it as far as the audit findings is concerned, the delays in submission of information, the misstatements in the annual financial statements, misalignments of annual performance plans and, 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 and annual performance 
reports. I actually wanted to, 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 to ask the question, but as the uh, presentation went on, I decided not as far as the financial implications is concerned pertaining to uh, the campaigns, because I've also noted that uh, 13 million rand has not been spent. And the excitement in you know, rebuilding the trust in the organization and the confidence should also be taken to uh, within the organization to do just that and what it actually uh, mean to us. Because if you, if you look at the organizational structure, also page, pages 26, you will see the vacancy rate and the organization performance and even what makes it worse is that uh, the, the presidency or the president has made this his priority in terms of paying uh, people within 30 days and, and which is not uh, actually happening. So we find ourselves with Brent as a, uh, you know, promoting ourselves there and to get everything right within the organization with an underspending of 29 million, the 29 million rent. So yes, uh, to the, the least to say that there is a huge but they do to peel with this organization. Let me speak to, 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 to Stets uh, SA. Uh, a great concern is the vacancy rate, which is at 80%, uh, 18%. And we must also admit that uh, it is not only loyalty, it's not good enough uh, a reason for someone to stay within the organization. But if you follow the trend, uh, you know, in the public service, you'll find that major reasons for those leaving the public service, leaving to prioritize their mental health. So my direct question is for an, a response to this committee is to, to find out as to whether there's exit interviews been, been held by this, the, the department, because at the end of the day, uh, uh, when you look at the, the, the leave, sick leave within the public uh, entity, uh, billions of rands are being spent uh, 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 through a, a government and all of these. And the other thing is, and I want to also add to my colleague when it comes to the complexities, you know, uh, when it comes to data collection, uh, it forms the core business and function of, of states SA. And with due respect, Mr. Maleka, I do not buy uh, the fact that you have extended the period to, to have everyone counted in. Uh, the issue of project implementation is of concern for me here. And, and, and one needs to be explained. Was there problems with training? What was the complexities? Is it capacity? Uh, is it uh, 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 quality assurance? So I think yeah, it, it's important, you know, I, I used to call what is transpired now with the reports on the vehicles that has not been delivered and tablets. I used to uh, 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 baptize uh, uh, states as a, that this is a fifth, uh, 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 fifth wave. And it is important for you, Mr. Mal Manuleka, to sanitize us with, with, with the real truth and, and justification on the real uh, issues because one of the things that you said yourself was the biggest challenge is operations. If the biggest challenge is operations, then let's name the problem. And if we name the problem, let us name the solutions as well. The other thing is when it comes to your field post, I'm very much interested in your figures there. Is it possible to submit to this committee also that figures per province and, and not uh, the way you have uh, uh, shown it uh, uh, to us. And then I want to ask a last question. What do you do when people don't want to be counted in? Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you, uh, Honorable Mutipe. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. I've got only questions for Stats SA. Uh, the department punished a published financial census of municipal municipalities time series from 2006 for first time. What is entailed in financial census for municipalities? What are the statistics about in this regard? The other one is the department reports that insolvency data could not be published 
due to challenge of Department of Justice. Are these challenges caused by data being litigious? If it is, if it could be published or the data is wrong or still being compiled. And the last one, you reported that data collection on census 22, 2022 has been extended to 20 March to allow field workers to reach as many households as possible. Will this not affect the budget, uh, the budget ring fenced for census or you still you will still need be within that you will still be within the budget thank you very much thank you honorable Ntipe. honorable Ntuli. thank you chairperson um chair uh, i'm partly, partly covered uh, by uh, the honorable members and honorable tb mentioned some of the issues that I was intending to, to ask as well. Uh, Chair, um, um, I also am joining the team in, in welcoming the, the presentations, the two presentations, uh, Stats SA and, and, and Brand SA. Um, starting with uh, Stats SA, um i wanted to touch in in terms of the vacancy rate if they do have any turnaround strategy of of skills transfer for younger generation making use of the institutional uh, memory uh, in so far as the aging profile is concerned and two, um, in terms of uh, the, the data collection progress uh, report, I, I wanted to check if this, uh, that, that extension will not uh, hit back in terms of the budget uh, and and the app i we appreciate the work and we also appreciate that extension so that the work is concluded but to check if it's not going to hit back uh, to the to to the department, and also, um, if they can share, if the department can share us, uh, give us the synopsis of challenges faced by the state SA team in remote areas during this period uh, of census twenty twenty two having um, face challenges of the ICT, even in urban areas, uh, to say how was the situation uh, with the remote areas. And also want to, uh, to upload uh, the, 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 the team on the ground, particularly here uh, at Umlazi, um, they, were, they were responding swiftly to all the problems. Uh, one had a, 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 a report in terms of the tablets and that report and, and that problem was solved uh, with immediate effect and they were able to 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 go ahead with the with their work uh, then with a uh, brand sa to check uh, the future of brand sa in terms of amalgamation to say uh, 
what have they positioned themselves if ever they fall uh, into amalgamation with tourism uh, if they can share that with us and also to to upload them to upload a uh, brand essay in terms of even reaching that two percent of a uh, disabled people and to to check a uh, the turnaround strategy in terms of a uh, doing away with a uh, Understanding. Hence, uh, it was seen that uh, there was uh, a lot of um, under expenditure. But moving forward, what are their intentions? Are you done, Honorable Ntuli? Chairperson, thank you so much. I'm done. Thank you. Okay. I thought you were just uh, uh, kicked out. Honorable members, thank you very much. Thank you, Brand SA team. Thank you, uh, Stats SA. Thank you, uh, DPME team. As I have said, <clears throat> the, the question, uh, the answers rather, to your questions will be sent to the office of the committee secretary. Then we'll get them as soon as they are sent through that office. Thank you very much for availing yourselves for this meeting. And now we have come to the end of the meeting and the meeting stands adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Chair. Aluta continua. Thank you.